Hallelujah. Who is holy? Oh, so holy. Who is righteous in all their ways? Who is mighty, strong and mighty? Haba Yahweh, the ancient of days. Holy, oh, so holy, who is righteous in all their ways, who is mighty, strong and mighty, Abba Yahweh, the ancient of days, holy. He's holy, righteous in all his ways, mighty, he's mighty, Abba Yahweh, the ancient of days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All praises to the Heavenly Father. Greetings, peace and blessings, shalom, shalom to all the Hebrew camps, congregation, Knesset, the nations, the Nethanim, the beloved Hebrew community near and far and scattered abroad. I am Chief Priest Banyala, presiding over the Sabbath class today at the House of Wisdom, properly titled The Name of Melchizedek. In this series, we have been diving deep into the meaning of these names that are absolutely important to our salvation. And today, we have not fallen short of that goal. The name of Melchizedek is absolutely extremely serious. But before we get into that, let's go into this introduction. Those who know about the Calendrical Study Guide, it is critically important. This is a major, major, major month. We're in the constellation of Reuben. Those that enter into their chamber of imagery go into the first gate, that gate of Reuben, which is firstborn of all of those who enter therein. But I want to talk about the characteristics of this Maseroth. This is why it's so important that every one of us get our calendrical study guides so that we will not be ignorant of Hasatan's devices. We are now in a curse win on the dark side of the year. Once again, those who have the calendrical study guide know exactly what we're talking about. I want to talk about the actual attributes of this curse win. And what is a curse win? It is a portal that opens up in this Maseroth or this constellation and these are the radiating lights that come down from the sun and it influences man. This is why in scripture it called people lunatic. Why? Lunar is the root word in dealing with madness. Madness of the moon. Why? Because the moon reflects the light of the sun. Alright, these things have a great influence on us. So, if you're walking through life and you're feeling dreary or you're feeling down, sad, dark, it's not because you're kind of, you know, you're just depressed. It's because this wind is pressing upon you. Let's look at some of the characteristics of this cursed wind, if you would, Priest Rasheem. The cursed wind of Maharai. You want to read the constellation? Yeah, Khan, the constellation. Meaning of Reuben, firstborn. This constellation influences the saints to prepare the first fruits of the winter harvest for the feast of the most high and as we have stated on many occasions that the six months beginning of the year reflect the six months ending of the year the exact same high holy day in scripture are written there it tells you that the same high holy days that are in the first six they end up in the second six especially the feast of weeks on the winter side now in this Maseroth, this constellation what can we expect do mildew fungus bacteria all right we have mildew fungus bacteria the messiah said leaven or bacteria is sin expect a plethora of sin to increase in this month let's read on hoarfrost darkness blackness so we're going to experience that darkness overwhelming darkness the opposite of light is going to be pressing down upon the saints read blackness cold Stagnation. Stagnation in your life. 
you're going to find yourself like not moving. Don't give up because the blessed wind is right around the corner. And this was prophesied. We need to shelter in place right now. We need to know that the Heavenly Father is watching us, seeing if we will be obedient. Read on. Freezing of agriculture. Now, when your agriculture is frozen, you don't offer your sacrifices. So your sacrifices are going to be challenged. You may be tired. You don't want to get into the O's. You just may skip a few days. This is all prophesied. We got to fight through this. Let's read on. Death. Death. You may be one of those who are experiencing spiritual death, walking away from the covenant, not interested in this walk, or you may be those who have physically experienced death. Satan is taking no prisoners. He need no prisoners. He want us dead. And there are a lot of brothers and sisters, unfortunately, falling away in this cursed month or this cursed wind. Let's read on. Cold, diminished warmth, Lukewarm, lack of love. Lack of love and lack of compassion. Those are the contributing factors in this month. So why walk around being all ignorant when somebody come against you? You should be like, I'm expecting that. I already knew it was coming. So I braced myself. I fortified myself. I'm walking circumspect because I have heads up because I got the calendrical study guide. Let's read on. Snow. Hindrance of harvest. We now have the hindrance again of you offering your tithes and oblations, sacrifices to the Heavenly Father. Continue. Tumult. Tumult. All in your life. This is chaos, pandemonium, all kind of upset. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong is what that means. Let's read on. Impediments. Mm -hmm. Spiritual blockages. We have impediments and spiritual blockages. In the spiritual realm, as we meditate and we give our oblation, we can see it. There are major impediments because there's an ambush toward us by Hasatan, that evil federation themselves, stopping us because this is the month of their power. How do we know? We just came through the darkest, longest night of the year called the winter solstice. And you can bet you can trust that they was up all day, all night, accusing us of everything that we have ever done. One thing we can do, we can learn from that. Because on the opposite side of the year is going to be the longest day, light, brightness of the year. Now you can find yourself saying that I'm going to go down to Panama City Beach, or I'm going to go on vacation, or I'm going to go chill. But I remember at the winter solstice, Satan didn't take a vacation. He wasn't relaxing. He wasn't chilling. He was accusing us like we need to accuse him and them and all of our enemies. Let's read on. Frost, cold, stagnation, freezing of agriculture, death. Once again, double death, twofold. We now have right before us the Heavenly Father telling us through the book of Enoch that these are the things that you're going to experience in the month of Maharai. So protect yourself, stand up, fortify yourself, walk circumspect, gird up the womb, the lowing of your mind, and be ready to fight the good fight in this month. Don't be a victim. Let's get Matthew 24, verse 12, if you would, priest. You can drop that. And because, of, and because iniquity shall abound. This is the reason for everything. Because iniquity, a.k.a. sin, shall proliferate. Read. The love of many shall wax cold. The love of many shall wax cold like in the midst of the winter, freeze up. And we don't have love keeping commandment with one another. There's like this pseudo superficial keeping commandment with one another. We may say shalom, shalom, brother, but yet we'll still go and chide and backbite and lie and do all kind of other things that the most I forbid. This is our time of fighting against Hasatan. Stand strong, understand, because iniquity, sin is proliferating. The commandments, the love for one another shall seize up. Paralysis have set forth in the midst of the children of Israel. Every person is out for his own belly, his own self. But where we're going, we're entering into a more communal setting. And I'm not talking about some little urban, little get-together. I'm talking about the Heavenly Father is bringing the children of Israel together to make a grand exodus out of this great Egypt. And so now, today is the time for us to stand up, recognize what we're fighting against. Read that once again, priest. 
And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So as written in the calendrical study, God, the spirit has shown us that when this will come upon us and we're not out of the tunnel just yet. It's still upon us. Yes, the new month is just a few days away and we're going to stand strong, Abba willing, and give those oblations in due time, due season, welcoming in that blessed month of the Heavenly Father, that blessed wind. Let's move over to 2 Ezra, the ninth chapter, Apocrypha 9, verse 7. And everyone that shall be saved and shall be able to escape by his works. Check that out. Everyone that is going to be saved and that shall escape the cursed winds of that Maseroth. You shall escape by your works. You know what that means? That means go tell your pastor that there's no unmerited favor. Unmerited favor means I can do whatever I want and Jesus just loved me. He loved him some me. I can do whatever. Law's done away with. You don't have to keep no Sabbath. You don't have to do anything. The scripture is telling you here, everyone that shall be redeemed. Everybody always talking about how saved they are. I'm saved. If you will be saved, you shall be saved and you shall escape these curse winds, these plagues, this pandemonium by your works. What do he mean your works? He's talking about how you atone how you remove sin, how you offer peace and thanksgiving offerings to the Heavenly Father. For this is the whole duty of man. We was created. The Heavenly Father created this whole heaven and earth and everything therein so that Adam and everything under him can worship Abba. But the whole world is out of whack. The whole world is null and void right now. None doeth righteousness. So the Heavenly Father has deemed it in his heart to regenerate, recreate it, and pull out a remnant that want to serve. And he will give them the power to serve. Read on. And by faith, whereby ye have believed. And faith, real faith. Your proof and evidence of the Most High, and the Most High receiving proof and evidence from you. It's two types of faith. You can give the Heavenly Father what he hasn't seen in you. Staying uh, 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 ten toes deep in it steadfast in it, not wavering, doing what Abba commanded. And you can turn around and receive faith from him as well. But this is how you will be saved, by your works and by your faith, whereby you have believed in this seventh covenant of Abba. Let's read on. Verse 8. Shall be preserved from the said peril. These are the ones that shall be preserved. These cursed winds are only getting worse and worse and worse. The Heavenly Father prophesied it. Just look around. Look at what's going on. It was a moment ago here in the West or in America where it was like five degrees. And then a week later, it's 75 degrees. The Most High is changing things up. You know what's happening? They're telling you that the, uh, the, uh, the poles are changing. All right? The North Pole, South Pole. They're saying that last year it moved 50 kilometers. And so they're not telling you that if the poles are moving north, what else is moving north? The equator. And what, what does that mean? The equator is moving closer to the city of Adam. When the, when the equator lands exactly on the city of Adam, you know that the time has arrived. And so the Most High is shaking things up. And they turn around and tell you that global warming is causing it to move. Mm -hmm. No, the Most High is moving it and is causing the global warming. All right, you can't do this. You didn't do this. The Most High is doing it. So as the poles begin to shift, pay close attention. You'll be, begin to see the longitudinal lines, the latitudinal lines, and all of them begin to shift and move. They're all moving northward where the equator will sit exactly on top of the city of Adam as it was in the days of old. Read 8 again. Shall be preserved from said perils and shall see my salvation in my land and within my border. So those who put in work, which simply means steadfast in their seventh covenant, offering those oblations, shall see my salvation in my land. What land? The nations will have you think that that is modern day Israel. That's not the case, my brethren. This is not where Adam was. 
This is where Noah went after the flood to the backyard of Adam's land. All right, we've covered this on many occasions. Check out the class we did about the city of Adam. The city of Adam is westward. The city of Adam is everything north of that uh, uh, equator. Dealing with North Africa, yes, all of Israel, Saudi Arabia, going all the way into India. All of that is Shem's land. Ham is south of that. Japheth is north of that. But the Heavenly Father is saying that there is a paradise or there is a pleasant land, Eden, the most ancient of land where everything started. And that's the city of Adam. And those who engage in work, those who have faith, those who believe unto the end shall be preserved from the foresaid evils. And the Most High shall transport them into the city of Adam within his borders. Let's read on. For I have sanctified them from me, for me from the beginning. Most High said they was already set apart from the beginning of time. Adam knew who was going to enter into that land. So it may sound like you can do something, you can make a change, you can will your way there. Most I already know. And he will not lose any of his numbers. So let us in this class learn who is Melchizedek so that we all can have our sure footing, sure seat, and a ticket to the city of Adam. Let's bring forth the introduction. Shalom, House of Wisdom family. This is Sister Tierra with your announcements on this 29th day of Maharai in the constellation of Reuben. As we continue in this month, let us keep in mind all the feasts of the Most High. Excuse me, Most High willing, the priesthood will be gathering on this third day, so-called January 10th, for the first day of the 11th month of Benaiah. In this month, as Chief Priest mentioned, lies the constellation of Simeon in which the Most High causes to grow. All of the saints are encouraged to join the priesthood as we offer the Most High his due sacrifices. And for members, if you're unable to join us in person, please do join us on the oblation line. We are also still in the Feast of Weeks. In this feast, the saints are commanded to send in their first fruits continually in preparation for the 50th day Feast of Weeks. Um, let us all continue to gain virtue in this Feast of Harvest. To register, please visit the Shekinah website at shekinah.com slash feast registration. We look forward to seeing you all then. To stay abreast of all of the upcoming Memorial Days and High Holy Days, visit the calendar page on the website to get your copy of the 2022 through 2023 Calendrical Biblical Study Guide. Although the year is concluding, this guide still um, contains pertinent information concerning our tithes, laws, statutes, and commandments, and this guide, once again, can be procured at shekinai.com slash calendar. In this time, um, as previously mentioned, we must continue to fill the storehouses by sending in our tithes. So the priesthood of the House of Wisdom has worked diligently to provide all of the tithe goods needed. So we have worked to provide the flour for the meat offering, the drink offering, we have wines available. We have both alcoholic and non-alcoholic wines available in a few different varieties. We have the olive oil as well as the salt. We have a Himalayan, a Himalayan salt and a black lava salt, as well as the incense, both the frankincense and the myrrh are available on the website, once again at shekinaya.com slash tithes. If you have placed orders for personal tithe use, then they will be arriving to you shortly. Um, if you enjoy all that the House of Wisdom puts out, in addition to your tithes, please do send in your free will offerings. These are monetary donations of any amount so that the gospel of peace may continue to be spread. And to send in your donations, visit shekinaya.com slash donate. As we continue in this winter season, it is important that we maintain our physical health as well as our spiritual health. So the House of Wisdom does offer two products. We have both the living waters, or the living waters, excuse me, in the double onyx, which is rich in fulvic mineral, minerals, excuse me, and colloidal metals, as well as the temple blend. Um, we do all use most of these, or both of these, um, and they are available on the website at shekinaya.com slash health. As we've previously mentioned, uh, True French has been expanded online, and so now we have a few different items to show. We have the vests which have the emblem on the back, as well as are bordered, and we have the long sleeve t-shirt in a few different colors, as well as the skull cap beanies, which you can see here. We also have the jean jacket in another color in the skull cap beanie. The jacket, as you can see, is bordered on the hems, and so we can all be res in resemblance of the temple, as mentioned in our statutes. So, 
In addition, for all those interested in joining the ranks of the priesthood, the pool is now open. Please visit shekinai.com slash priest application to apply to join the pool. We will most high willing have classes available for all three divisions of the priesthood, being the priest, the porters, and the holy singers. And so we look forward to seeing all those who have shown interest. If you enjoy the Sabbath classes and would like to further your understanding during the week, the House of Wisdom offers a few other classes. We have the Daughters of Wisdom course, which meets every first day, um, which is so-called Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sisters that are already in the class do be advised that class this first day will be canceled or will be postponed until um, next week, most high willing. Please do check the chats for any updates concerning that. For our non-Israelite brethren, we also have Unity, which is United Nations and Tabernacles of Yahweh Shai, which also meets on first days, or so-called Sundays, at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, for all, we have the weekly Bible study on fourth day, or so-called Wednesday, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And all those who join are able to sharpen their understanding of the seven pillars of wisdom and gain other practical knowledge. Um, and for those that have registered for membership online, we have seen all of those files. And we are currently working on opening up the official membership. I'll be willing, when it is available, we will release it and release all the proper channels so that we can get that rolling. If you have any questions, comments, or inquiries, please email the correspondence team at houseofwisdom at shekinaya.com. Once again, that's houseofwisdom at shekinaya.com. And most high willing, one of the members of the correspondence team will be with you at their earliest convenience. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share all of the videos so that we can continue to grow the channel and spread the gospel of peace. And all of the aforementioned links can be found in the description box of this video. So I will now turn, direct your attention back over to Chief Priest Panyala for the name of Melchizedek. May the peace offerings be multiplied to you all. Shalom. 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 Again. Those who have their calendrical study guide are well prepared for the tumults that are thrown at us daily by the adversary. We know exactly what to do. We know exactly what hour to enter into so that we may be afforded that protection from Abba. Now, we are in the fifth week of the Feast of Seven Weeks. We're ending the fourth week. Now, these seven weeks are a resemblance to the seven ages of creation. So in every one of the weeks, it behooves you to put in your chamber of imagery what befell the saints during those times. And Priest Rashim went through last week uh, the name of Satan, Hasatan, how that in the fifth age, in that fifth age, we had Bohemoth and Leviathan rebelling against Abba because they did not want to bow down to the younger one, which was Adam. Go listen to the class if you want the details. But what does that mean for us? that we should be on the lookout for being rebellious, stiff-necked, proud, arrogant against Abba. Look at all the things that the adversary is hurling out at us. All manner of darkness and death and rebellion. So we need to be stoic, we need to be steadfast, and we need to be compliant and acquiescent to the will of the Heavenly Father in the Seventh Covenant. With that said, let's end the introduction and let's begin the class, The Name of Melchizedek.
Once again, we are back with the class, the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a very interesting figure, very enigmatic. He's here for a moment in the scriptures, then he's gone. And nobody knows, or very few people know who he is or what he was. And so we have people trying to make sense of this enigmatic figure in the scripture. And we can now digest and ascertain some of the error of their ways. But let's first, let's go to the famous Genesis, the fourth chapter, the 18th verse. And we're also going to read it in Reshith, the translation that we're working on here studiously at the House of Wisdom. Genesis, KJV, 14, 18. And unto Enoch was born. 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High Abba. Now, we've heard some scholars say, I mean, this was the most paltry and dismal interpretation ever. He said, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He brought forth refreshments to Abraham, because Abraham thirsty, was thirsty and his throat was parched. Forgetting or not knowing any of the salient points here. But now we have in the KJV, it's not a bad translation. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was a priest of the Most High God. All right, so now let's turn around and have a rendering of it in Rashith. Malak Zadok. Now we have now the translation, the transliteration of his name. So Melchizedek. Melchizedek, that Romanized version, tells you nothing. It's just a person's name. But now when you digest it in the Hebrew, you have a compound or two compound words. All right, words that have been put together to mean one thing. And what is the first word? We have malak, or they may say malek in the modern. Or in Arabic, they may say malik. All right, all of it mean one thing. If we can pull up the diagram for Malak, or Melchizedek, actually. And so we have his name being translated, and we're using a more paleo form of Hebrew, not the modern invention that the desert penguins have put together. If they put together their own, we can have the authority to do our own as well. And we covered how in the 1800s, nearly the 20th century, they just came together and formulated that new modern Hebrew with a lot of European languages all conflated together and, you know, masquerading under a Hebrew text. But that's not the subject today. We have Malak Zadok, what they may call in the modern Melki Tzedek, all right? Melki Tzedek. And so, or Romanized Melchizedek. Uh, Malik Tezek. So we have here, we've got the chart up. All right. Now let's go ahead and break the word up. The first word is Malak. Let's bring Malak up. Malak or Malek means king. All right. And so what we have here is two words compounded together to make a name. The first word is Malak. Now we're going to bring up the second word, which is Zadak. Or some people from the paleo may remember Tazadak. All right, Zadak, which simply means righteousness. All right, righteousness. So bring these words, compound them together. What do you have? You have king of righteousness. Absolutely. All right, and now in the Hebrew, the name is mentioned twice. And anytime you see the name mentioned twice, it is for you to say it in its compounded form and then also to translate what it means. The Heavenly Father don't want you to just look over and call him Jimmy or John or whatever. He wants you to know what is the meaning of that name. So let's read it again in Reshith 14, 18. Malak Zadok, king of righteousness. So now Malak Zadok, which was the king of righteousness. What about this king of righteousness? Being the king of peace. He's also known as the king of peace. Now, for us in the seventh covenant, this comes easy. We know exactly what that means. Other folk 
make you think that that means he was a very tranquil priest. He was very gentle and soft-spoken, and he just passed out lilies and daffodil and candy wherever he went, making peace. That's not what it's talking about. This is Malat Zadok, a righteous king, king of righteousness, being the head over what? Let's finish it. Peace offerings. He was over the peace offerings of Abba. And those who are acquainted with the ecclesiastical order and rites, we know that the peace offering is the ultimate sacrifice you give Abba, tethered with a propitiation of incense on a golden altar. He was over that. And what did that make him? Let's read. Brought forth bread and wine offering. So look at what he did. Noticeably, check out what's missing. He brought forth bread and wine. Where's the beast? Where's the lamb, the ram, the turtle dove? It's not there. Oh, are we in some New Testament Matthew, Mark, Luke? No, 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 no. We in Bereshith, as you call it. We're in Genesis, and the man is here giving the original sacrifice with bread and wine. And we're going to conclude it with a return of Melchizedek, bringing back the bread, bringing back the wine, showing us that this is the original acceptable sacrifice of the Heavenly Father. Even though we have gone through and transitioned through seven covenants, the first covenant is the last, and the last is a resemblance of the first. And so, yes, in these covenants from Adam to Noah, they began to devolve. And then when Abraham came on the scene, Melchizedek met him right here and said, let me give you a taste of the original sacrifice. And then after him, Isaac embraced his covenant. Then Jacob, and then Israel through Moses, six covenants. Now the heavenly father said, I have a final covenant bearer. His name is David. And his covenant shall be established and the offering shall be with bread and wine as we see David bringing on many occasions. And many of the prophets after him in that covenant bringing forth bread and bringing forth wine, engaging in oblations, not sacrament like the, like the Catholics, engaging in a absolute sacrifice that's accepted to Abba. Let's read the 18th verse completely again. Malak Zadok, king of righteousness, being the king of peace offerings, brought forth bread and wine offerings. He is the eternal high priest of the angelic watchers. This is what's missing. The word Elion at the end, they just kind of make it something benign. He is the chief high priest priest, the highest of all priests over the angelic watchers. Who were the angelic watchers? They were the one that was here in the beginning in the first age, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. They was the one that created everything. But who was over all of them? As we translate it, Reshith, the first chapter, you find out that the word is Amar. But the simple translator look at it and said, that just means talk. That just means say. But what was written in John 1 and 1? In the beginning was the word. Same thing as Amar, same thing as talk, same thing as say. They can't understand how deep and complex the Bible is. And so they just come with a thick veneer of gobbledygook. And we fall for it. Mm -hmm. And so this Amar, this word, Melchizedek, was there from the beginning. He is the one that said to the Elohim, make a covenant with the angelic federation in heaven and make a covenant with Ithrets in earth right now because Abba said it through the Urim and the Thummim. Then he turned around and tell him, let's turn around and let's make the grass. Let's make the vegetation. Let's separate the land. Let's separate the water and let us do all these things. This is the, uh, the chief oracle speaking. This is... Melchizedek talking. We're going to prove that emphatically today. And we're going to talk about some of the errors, once again, that some of our people and some of the uh, older ones from back in the day have gone through and made that fatal kiss of death in comprehending who Melchizedek is. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't get Melchizedek right, you'll see, I'll be willing, by the end of this class, that you are slated for hellfire. You are slated for damnation and being forsaken. It's unfortunate that there are some of us that just don't want to hear it. But it is what it is. We carry on, and we'll think about that later. We're going to read on. Let's finish that up. 
Actually, let's get it and uh, go back to where you were in Genesis 14, 18. And we'll read 19 and 20. And he blessed him and, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High Abba, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed the Most High Abba, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So we have Malak Zadok, Romanized as Melchizedek, a king of righteousness, and being the king of the peace offerings, brought forth the bread of the bread meat offering and wine of the drink offering. This is not for refreshments, not because Abraham's throat was parched. It's because he was ready to offer a sacrifice. And when he did it, he raised up his hand and began to bless Abraham. This is what happens when you worship Abba in due season and in due time. You give your oblations unto him, and as stated in Ecclesiastes, the 50th chapter, you bow down at the end, and the Most High will send a blessing unto you. And we're not going to read the whole story. But the king of the Sodomites came and said, Abraham, you can keep all our wealth. You can keep everything. Just give us back this and that. Abraham said, you can keep all that trash. I have raised my hand unto the Most High. What does it mean when you raise your hand unto the Most High? You heave something unto the Most High. What is a heave offering? When you go up with it. And what is a wave offering? When you wave back and forth. So in this particular instance, when you give to the Most High, it's simply a heave offering. And he said, I've raised my hand unto the Most High. Ain't no way in this world I'm going to take your trash. And then you turn around when the Most High has increased me. You say, you made me rich. Mm -hmm. He said, you can keep all that crap. You can keep it all. He had faith, trust in the Most High and Melchizedek or Malak Zadok that was right before him. And so this is the type of faith that each and every one of us must have if we're going to enter into the city of Adam. We're going to leave from there. And let's talk about a couple of mistakes that our people make. Uh, and especially, think about this, right? You had the Pharisees, that sect of Hebrews, and you had the Sadducees, that sect of Hebrews. In 65 AD, the Romans began to pillage the city. And at 70 AD, the, the city fell. And the children of Israel were dispersed. But who were still the heads at this time? We had the true saints of the new covenant being pushed out into many dark places in the interiors of Africa. And those who stood to charge were essentially the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they turned into people who began to try to codify and assemble and hold the knowledge that they had. And they began to call themselves the Mesorites. And they began to take this knowledge and formulate it in a way that was unique to them. But it wasn't always the case. Think about it. The Pharisees, Sadducees knew nothing about prophecies when the Messiah roamed the land. And how much more did they know when he left? Nothing. And so you got to question what they give us. Now, in the beginning, the Masoretes started making things like the Mishnah or the Talmud. It was okay in the beginning, but as they began to die off, who took it? Them big chubby penguins, them fat desert penguins got it, put their dirty beaks on it, and began to write all kind of child pornography and all kind of other crap in there. That's why it cannot be trusted. That's why we tell you to chuck the toe mood, spit on the toe mood, burn it when you can. Because it's pure, unadulterated trash. All right, you can't get anything from it, got to get it from the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, Rakak Wadash of the Most High. But look at what they have done. Let's examine it now. Joshua, the 10th chapter, start at the very first verse. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it. So now we have here, we're going to bring up the chart, Adoni Zedek. Ah, sound very, very similar, right? Now it came to pass when Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem. Let's pause and look at this compound word. If you just put Malak in front of it, you would have Malak Zedek. And so the simple would say, I think this may be this Malak, this may be Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. Because Adoni means Lord or Master. And so they try to conflate and say, Lord, Master, that, that, that could mean King. It doesn't. 
all right, at all. And it makes no sense when you read the entire story. All right, we have, now it came to pass that Adoni Zezek, king of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, this is before David, Solomon, even the children of Israel were in the land. Why was there a city of Jerusalem? Because Noah knew where the most I would place his name. And when he began to disperse the land to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, he knew that the place where the Most High would receive the peace offering, he placed it there, and he gave it to his children. But the children of Cain, or Canaan, stayed in our land. And so they just positioned themselves to be evicted at a later point. They were not the indigenous people of that land. But that's not the subject today. Let's read on. As he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. Verse 2. All right, let's pause right there, and we're going to come back to that in a moment. We're going to move over to Jasher 16, verse 7. This is why we tell you when we read these books, you got to have a, a, a very, very strong filter. Because once again, those desert penguins have come in and put their dirty little beaks and began to assert things in there. It's not that the book is trash, the book was good, but they have had it for hundreds, if not over a thousand years to begin to adjust things, to try to make a sense of things. And so this enigmatic figure comes up in Genesis 14, and they just say, who is this guy? We don't know his background. We don't know where he went. We know nothing about him. Let's try to make sense of it. And what they did is began to mangle certain verses in the book of Jasher. Jasher 16, verse 7. And Abram heard this, and he rose up with about 318 men that were with him. And he that night pursued these kings and smote them. All right, so this is the same story found in Genesis 14, chapter. Let's jump down to the 11th verse, uh, 10th verse. And Bera, king of Sodom, and the rest of his men that were with him, went out with the lime pits into which they had fallen to meet Abram and his men. And Adoni Zadok. Ah, sound familiar? Adoni Zadok. And so what they did is extrapolate it from Joshua 10 and said, oh, let's make that Melchizedek conflate it and make it one. Once again, these are assertions by the hand of those unworthy to be doing any kind of translation whatsoever. Once again, they're trying to make sense. Look at the next verse. Just keep reading, actually. And a, okay, verse 11. And Adoni Zadok, king of Jerusalem, the same was Shem. The same was Shem. Mm. Shem. Hmm. It seems to me somebody once again tried to make sense of it. This is Abraham. What great patriarch was still living during the time of Abraham? Oh, it must be. Shem was, let's do the math. Shem was living. Mm -hmm. Shem was Adoni Zadok. Shem was Melchizedek. And if you believe that, you have completely lost your salvation. Mm. Shem is not about to save you. Shem didn't even have his own covenant. Shem fell under his father covenant, Noah. The father only established another covenant with Abraham after him. So that is absolutely, once again, a perfunctory attempt to try to dissuade, as you'll see in a little bit, the path of the saints in the last days. Read 11 again. And Adoni Zadok, king of Jerusalem, the same was Shem, went out with his men to meet Abram and his people with bread and wine, and they remained together in the valley of Malek. All right, let's just go with the narrative for a moment. Let's say Adoni Zadok is Shem, right? Let's say he is Melchizedek. Let's go back to Joshua, the 10th chapter, and pick it up where he left off, Joshua 10, verse 2. That they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city. So Adoni Zedek, Shem, start calling up these Amorites and saying, Hey, this man, Joshua, is coming into our area. This is what Melchizedek, this is what Shem is saying. Let's read. As one of the royal cities, and by the way, this is, Hundred ye hundreds of years past Shem, all right? We came out of Egypt at this time, going into the land of Canaan, claiming the land, but once again, perfunctory attempt to deceive the saints. Let's read on. And because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty, verse 3, 
where Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent, it to, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Param, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, and unto Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it had made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. So are you telling me that Melchizedek, Shem the son of Noah, came to Joshua and said, uh, we, we got to overthrow you, Joshua. Mm. And plus call me an Amorite as well. Once again, it does not balance. It makes no sense. So don't try to make it make sense. Walk away from it. Again, these weak attempts to take us off of our trajectory of salvation. Read on. Verse 5. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites. So that's who it was, five kings of the Amorites. And just because it is called Lord of Righteousness, we have Cain adopting the righteous name of Seth and his holy offspring. We had a Mahalalil, he had a Mahalalil. We had a Lamech, he copied Lamech. We had an Enoch, he called his firstborn Enoch. Just because it says Lord of Righteousness didn't mean he was righteous. If they was righteous, the Amorites would have never been in that land. They would have heed the charge of their forefathers. Get to the land that was given unto you. So let's not fall for these traps, these snares that they set out to catch us so that we don't see the importance of who Melchizedek really was, who he is, and what he will be in the future in your relationship with him as it appertains to worshiping our heavenly glorious Abba. We're going to move from there and go back to Genesis 1418, uh, Priest Azaria. And then you're going to read once again, Reishi 1418, Priest Rashim. And we're going to move on. Genesis 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High Abba. All right, let's read it with understanding. Reishi 1418. Malak Zadok, king of righteousness, being the king of peace offerings, brought forth bread and wine offerings. He is the eternal high priest of the angelic watchers. Don't let anybody debase Melchizedek, all right? Not that Shem was evil, but Shem was no Melchizedek, all right? He was a man, a son of Noah, all right? None of these men that were in this fallen state that Adam was in, being an offspring of Adam, had any contrast unto the oracle, Amar, the word, or Melch, uh, Malak Tazak. All right, let's read on. Uh, let's leave there, actually. Let's go to Psalms 110, verse 4. We're going to cover all the normal bases before we get to some of the more deep, mysterious things appertaining to Melchizedek. And for those who are out there sagacious amongst us, taking copious notes, please do. And we open it up at the end of every class for questions. And I pray that the heavenly Abba, Abba Yahweh, give us answers. I'm actually exploring that we can actually get the phone back in here again. It's a little hard kind of, you know, typing all these questions and whatnot where you can just call in and uh, live and get your questions answered. I'll be willing. All right, let's read Psalms 110, verse 4, KJV. The Most High hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right, so if we read it from the top, David is in his chamber of imagery. Seeing the Most High talking to the oracle, talking to the word. And the Most High promising him a thing. He said, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Continue. Verse 5. The Most High at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead All bodies. right. Let's stop right there. Let's go now to the more perfect translation from the Urim and the Thummim. Let's get Psalms 110, verse 4, in a, the more perfect translation. Abba Yahweh will not change the words of his covenant. So now we have, as we covered in the very first class, Haya means everlasting, immortal. All right, that's what Haya means, or the tetragrammaton. That's not the personal name of the Heavenly Father. It means immortal. And as you'll see today, too, what was tethered to that is Ab or Abba. What we address him as is the eternal everlasting father. You will never get the Most High's personal name. He's not going to tell you his name is Jimmy. 
Just doesn't work that way. You are his child. You call him father. And that's it if you have any respect. And so here he's telling you, the Masorites got in it and thought once again that taking the name of the Most High in vain means just saying his name. We covered that as well. Taking the name of the Most High in vain is entering into his covenant, putting his name upon you and you don't do the covenant. And so what did they do with their superstition? Let's take out some of these vows. Let's separate the words so people don't just vainly say the Most High's name. Till this day, you got people saying, you can't say God. Don't say God. Mm -hmm. Or they tell you, don't say the Tetragrammaton. Don't say it. You say it, all kind of dark things will happen. There was one brother I was talking to, one, I, I, this, this is etched in my memory. When he got to the tetragram and he says it's not pronounced, it's yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so when he was reading, every time he got to the tetragram and the yes, <laughs> like, I'm out of here, brother. I got to go. You be well, I'm gone. <laughs> so many superstitions surrounding this. When the Heavenly Father wants you to address him as everlasting, immortal Father. There's nothing negative about that. And taking the name of the Most High in vain is, wor is, is simply saying that you enter into this covenant and now you shellaxing. You don't want to come. You don't want to give. You don't want to support. You don't want to do anything. All right, so here we have Abba Yahweh. Read that again. Abba Yahweh will not change the words of his covenant. He will not change the words of this covenant. Who did he make a covenant with? Read. Which he promised unto Malak Zadok. Which he promised unto Malak Zadok. Look at that. He promised to Malak Zadok. Now I'm going to go back. Abba Yahweh would not change the words of his covenant. All right. The words of this oath. And so when you see in... Uh, uh, um, the KJV the order of Melchizedek we didn't bring that up but it is the word debris and this word derives from debar anybody familiar with what debar mean absolutely you find that in Exodus 34 these ten commandments which the word is ten words which by causation is a commandment if you speak it it's commandment so that's how they do the translation at times. So it's actually saying here, makes sense. These are the words promised to Melchizedek. So when you hear the order of Melchizedek, let's not get confused. It simply means that these are the words that the Most High codified in a covenant to Melchizedek. And what was those words? Let's for, read. For he is the king of righteousness, the eternal priest. He is the eternal, everlasting priest. Priest. He will be here from the beginning and he will be here in the end. There will be times when he will leave temporary priests on the earth, but it's temporal. And his priesthood is everlasting. Let's read it again from the top. Abba Yahweh will not change the words of his covenant, which he promised unto Malak Zadok, for he is the king of righteousness, the eternal priest. He is the king. Remember that word. Not only is he the king of righteousness, he is the king of priests. And the Most High promised to him that he will have the eternal, everlasting, immortal priesthood. That wasn't promised to Shem. Not at all. Okay? Not at all. And especially Adoni Malek, a Tezek. Wasn't given to some Amorite running around Canaan, trespassing, an interloper. You know, a transient in our land, and he's this, the eternal priest. The heathens, let me make this clear, have no right to even touch our book, let alone try to translate it. Come on. And for us acquiescing to their translation, show how, how gone we are. How gone we are. This is a right reserved for you and you alone. Step up to your inheritance. Step up to your birthright. Reclaim what the Most High has given to you. They have their gifts. We have ours. I will give. I'm going to go to Jeremiah 23, verse 1. We're taking it easy from now. We're going to skyrocket in a moment. But we want to make sure that everybody see that this man is immortal. And time will not permit, as I said before, the Masorites and some of the later uh, Khazars came through and began to try to make sense of this enigmatic uh, 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 figure. And so what they did is say, that, hey, this must be Shem. Being unspiritual is nothing wrong. When we find Gideon threshing wheat and under the Midianites, and who came to him? Was it Shem? 
That was an angel. Why do we think it's so ridiculous for an angel to come down and have a conversation with you and to break bread with you? What did he do? He got bread. He got wine. And he gave a sacrifice. And Gideon said, now I know that I've seen the face of the Most High. He was not the only one. Scores and scores of angels. Who met Abraham and Sarah and promised them that they would have a child? Angels. Throughout our history, angels with no beginning and no end, not of this earth, have come to meet us, our ancestry. And then to turn around and say that that is a carnal man, once again, shows the limited uh, spirituality in a lot of our people. And any Israelite proclaiming that Melchizedek is Shem, once again, anybody hearing that, should literally get up and walk out after hearing this class because you're going to see how important it is to have that immortal one advocating on your behalf. Jeremiah, no, uh, Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High Abba. All right, so he's now once again exposing and showing the original sacrifices. If you have bread, if you have wine, this is that eternal sacrifice that you see secretly, mysteriously, the saints doing throughout history. You'll see them talking about giving the calves of their lips, but they had the bread in their hand, and they had the wine in their hand. You see Daniel looking out at his window at the ninth hour, a thousand miles away in Babylon, Praying to the Most High, wine in hand, bread over here, the cast of his lips, speaking to the Most High, giving his audible spiritual sacrifices. See, these sacrifices, these sacrifices of that first covenant and the last covenant can be done in any captivity. The previous ones, though, you only can do in Jerusalem at the temple. And you need the Levitical priesthood, the sons of Aaron, the golden, the brazen altar, the candlesticks, the sanctuary, and the curtains, and so forth and so on. You'll never get that, and if you depend on that sixth covenant or a mosaic covenant, you will never get there. And so the Most High graciously said, let me give you a covenant that's more applicable to your times. Just like Abraham, his covenant was applicable to his time. Noah's covenant was a little bit more harder than Abraham's covenant. And so was Adam. It was a different time, different age, and they had no problem with transitioning. We're the only ones got a problem with transitioning. We hold Moses' covenant or the covenant with Israel through Moses as if it's an immutable thing. When Moses himself said, another shall come like unto me. Hear you him. This is temporary. This is going to come to an end. You guys going to go into slavery? How did Moses know you was going into slavery? Because he was the author of Deuteronomy 28, 68. And when he, before he died, he said, I know you barely kept it when I was here. <laughs> After my death, how you wicked knuckleheads, how wicked will you get? And, tr and read, they have gotten tremendously wicked. Everything they saw, they wanted to worship it. I mean, anything move it, they was worshiping. The rod that Moses used to heal them, later on, they was like bowing down to it. All right, the king was like, yo, burn that thing up. Israel, idolatry is our crack and meth. All right, we will worship anything somebody throw in our face. Mm -hmm. And if they promise you prosperity, double time we on it. And so Moses knew that we was going to recede into evilness and the Most High will open up another covenant. Let's read on. Verse 19, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the Most High Abba. So when you give your bread, your wine, and you give your spiritual oblations, the Most High brings the opposite of Deuteronomy 28. The opposite of Deuteronomy 2015, uh, 28, 15. What does it say? If you do not hearken unto the voice of the Most High thy power to observe to do all his commandments, this day all these curses shall come upon you. Why? Because you are not giving him the bread and the wine. And examine the curses. The curses are, curse shall be everything in your field. Your corn shall rot in the field. Why? Because you didn't bring it to Abba and offer it to him. Your grapes shall wither on the vine. Why? Because you didn't make wine and give him drink offering. Your ceiling shall be brass and your floor shall be iron. Why? Because you took the gold out the temple. Everything that was in there as a curse was because you did it to the Most High. Abandoning his worship. And so he said here, if you offer the bread and wine, the opposite of Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 68 will come upon you. A blessing will be upon you which is found in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 through 14.
Let's read. Possessor of heaven and earth. Verse so the most high possess, he owns heaven and earth. And anything in it is his. He owned it before you had it. Why you don't want to give it back to him? He's just checking to see what you're going to do. Let's read. Verse 20. And blessed be the Most High Abba, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Check that out. Why would the Most High give you, give your enemies into your hand? Because he just loves you? No, he wants you to take that wealth and establish the offerings. What is a tithe? It is not the Creflo Dollar, the prosperity gospel preaching, money sow a seed so you can get rich. It is offering the Heavenly Father that heave offering so that the oblations, propitiation, sacrifice can continue forever and ever and ever. So does the most side that causes a poor man to be rich so that he can continue to sacrifice. This is what Melchizedek did in the past, and this is what he's going to do in the future according to prophecy. We will prove it. It is he that will make your enemies powerless. It is he that will give you the opportunity to stomp them, to crush them, and to open yourself up for that brilliant resurrection that the Most High has promised. Let's drop that and get Jeremiah 23. Start at the first verse. Isaiah 9 and 6. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Most High. Most High said, woe unto these jack leg pastors feeding you that feel good theology motivational speakers and not uh teachers of truth that's what it is turn on tbn that is the walk of death that is nothing but pure comatose darkness right there everything is motivate 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 God. and we get on it and what we do we get motivated we got our hands all on the tv screen and name of jesus healed me Heal me. Looking for freedom and liberation through that crap. Once again, if a Gentile is the head of that organization, it is not based on Abba. It's not at all. And that's not a racist statement. That's not his lot. Mm -hmm. Let's read. Verse 2. Therefore, thus saith the Most High Abba, Yahweh of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, Ye have scattered my flock and driven, driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, said the Most High. So Abba Yahweh said unto these pastors, these ministers, you have actually dispersed my children. You have gone in their head and you have watered down this truth. And so the Most High, therefore, is against you. Read. Verse 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven, driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which, I, which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Most High. So the Most High said that in the days to come, future prophecy, I will begin to gather together the dispersed and I will bring true shepherds, true leaders that shall feed them and feed them with righteousness as we covered in the beginning in the intro. Everyone that shall be saved shall be saved by their work. Meaning your works in righteousness. You will be weighed in the balance. How much sin you have versus how many sin offerings you gave. And so you have mountains of sin. You got mountains of sin offering. All right, balanced out. Come on in. But if you got mountain of sin, no sin offering, go that way. Same with the trespass. Same with the peace. And so here he's saying he's going to begin to gather. Read on. Verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Most High, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch. Check that out. I will raise unto David a righteous branch. So this prophecy appertained to David, the founder of the seventh covenant, and the heavenly father saying, out of his loin, I will raise up a righteous offspring. Read. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall ex execute judgment and justice in the earth. So this king shall execute justice or righteousness. Going back to king of righteousness in the earth. So a prophecy, a subtle prophecy, 
once again, is sheltered in the offsprings of David. Let's read on. Verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. So here's a prophecy that hasn't come to pass yet. He said, in his days, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom shall dwell together safely. Because of this king, what else shall this king be called? And this is his name where, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So he shall be a king, Malak, and also Tazak or uh, Tazadak. So he shall be the king of righteousness. Melchizedek shall bring this together. Melchizedek is going to order this, a righteous king. All right, Malak Tazadak. Let's drop that. Let's go to Isaiah, the ninth chapter, sixth verse. And if you'll grab Hebrews, the seventh chapter, first verse. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty Abba. So now he's saying, Isaiah, prophesying about this child that we just read about in Jeremiah 23. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government, that's the thing, the government, what is that? The kingship shall be upon his shoulder, like rank on a general's shoulder. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Read on. The mighty Abba. And he shall take on these names. This is the name he's going to take on. Wonderful. He shall be called Counselor. He shall take on, he's the word of the mighty Abba. And who else? The last one after Mighty Abba? The Everlasting Father. Pay attention to that. What does that sound like? Let's marinate on that for a moment. You got Enoch? Yeah. No, you keep reading. Everlasting Haya, Father, Abba. Yahweh Abba. Or Abba Yahweh. And so here we see from the first class, the Heavenly Father is telling us that this is what you call him. All right, this is going, he's going to send Melchizedek to address this, to tell you, because he is the word. He's going to show you how to address the everlasting father, Haya Abba. And what else? The prince of peace. Now, we already know what prince mean. Jacob was called a prince of the most high and men. What is the prince? It's the priest. Absolutely. Ezekiel 45. So what do we have? Priest of peace. Melchizedek was the king priest of peace offerings. And so this, once again, is foretelling, forecasting the return of Melchizedek. He came here benevolently during the times of Abraham. But he was prophesied to come during the time of Judah and Israel and bring that dispersed nation who have been brutalized, beat down by these pastors. He's going to destroy them all and bring the remnant together. Malak Zadok is going to do this, all right? And so it is critically important that we put a focus on him. He is not the Most High. He is the oracle, the word, the messenger of the Most High, doing the will, the bidding of Abba, because he has the authority to do it. And so if you're looking for sweet Jesus from the Christian sense, you're still looking wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe in a messianic figure, you're still wrong. You're going to be those who are left behind. As you'll see in a little bit, the Most High is saying, uh, you ain't got to go, but you got to get off my earth and you can't come into my heavens. <laughs> now figure out where you're going to go. Mm -mm. That is a horrible position to be in. Mm. Where are you going to go? He owns everything. And you got 24 hours to do it. So let's pay close attention so that we can find ourselves in line with the will of Abba. All right, let's read on, priest. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace. What is his government? We talk about in Chronicles, the government of David, the order of David. We find the 24 lots. We find the 12 months. We find the morning, noon, and the evening. This is the government, that royal government that he has established. David didn't establish this. This was established from the days of old. This is why you find in the book of Adam and Eve that Adam was coming in the ninth lot. How he knew about the ninth lot? He came in the 24th lot of Maaziah. How he know about the 24th lot? Because they was here way before David. 
David was just giving that first covenant. It's the last covenant, and the, and the last is the first. And so he didn't invent this. It was an inheritance that he received. And what an honor it is for us to walk within it. Let's read that again, priest. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Most High of hosts will perform this. All right, so we find here that David's kingdom shall be ordered and established with judgment and with justice, which means righteousness, king of righteousness or righteous king from henceforth and forevermore. The zeal, the will of the Most High will perform this thing. And if the Most High will it, who can stand against him? Who can say, nah, I don't want that to happen? Nobody. And so we must be properly aligning our hope, salvation. We must understand from whence it come. If you're hoping to be a multi-billionaire, your hope is skewed and misaligned. If you're hoping to get the biggest camp out there, your hope is, mis is skewed and misaligned. Somebody sent me something that a brother was doing on social media, talking about, who's your greatest teacher? Name three of them. Israel is, is evil. I mean, there's no other way of saying it. We are so embraced in this. It's almost like we think it's the source awards. <laughs> Who's going to get the best teacher? The best teacher award. Here it is. Like Amos was saying, Zephaniah, boy, I'm going to beat you in your preaching, boy. I'm, boy, I'm going to get you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach more deeper than you, Amos. A prophet, a preacher, a teacher of the Most High is concerned about getting out of here, not getting a teaching award, not, not, not pitting teachers against each other. You know, I don't know what these young Israelites be talking about. I know nothing about what they are into. I can't understand it. I don't understand their music. What's, what's next? The Hebrew Music Awards? They probably got that. I don't, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All that stuff sounds like some young Jeezy, young Jocks, some Kanye mixed with Jay-Z and throw a Yahawashi, Judah, here and there and there. And it's supposed to be cool. We're supposed to be singing psalms of praise to the Most High and not rocking out liquor, stuff you get drunk to. You're supposed to be singing in the midst of oblation if you got singing talents. And you should be trying to get out of here, not trying to receive some teaching award. Are pitting teachers against each other. Who, who doesn't matter. I'm. Th I, I didn't even see it. I hope nobody recommended House of Wisdom. Please don't. We want nothing to do with that type of madness that is pervasive amongst our people. We are looking for the return of Malak Zadok. All right, and he's going to gather the dispersed of us, and he's going to begin to take us into the land of the inheritance, the boundaries of the Most High. All of that other stuff can stay right back here because it will burn. We're going to drop that, and we're going to go to Hebrews, the seventh chapter, and pick it up at the very first verse. For this Mechazeldech, king of Salem, priest of the Most High Abba Yahweh, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. Once again, it's so important that we have a better, more perfect translation because some can take this for Melchizedek, king of Salem, Virginia. Like, it looked like a town right there, and some think it's a town. But Salem, or Salim, is nothing but shalom, shalom, peace. And peace, as Gabariah covered in the name of peace, simply means the peace offerings to the Most High. And when you say shalom to each other, you're saying, may the peace offerings be multiplied through you, brother or sister. And so he was the king over the peace offering, priest of the Most High. So he was a king and a priest offering the ultimate peace offerings to Abba. Read. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Verse 2. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Once again, Salem is peace, peace offerings, not a geographical location. So we have here, the Heavenly Father is telling Paul to address this to the Hebrews, how great Melch 
uh, Malak Zadok was and is and will be. And we need to put our focus on him. All right? Let's go to John 8, chapter, the 54th verse. Let's show you who this Melchizedek was. Yahweh I answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your armor. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I, and if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Let's pause for a second. The Messiah was talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and he admonished them. He talked about how he was conversing with Abba Yahweh. Then he turned around and said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see me when I saw him in my day. Read. And he saw it and was glad. He saw me and he was glad when he saw me. When did the Messiah meet Abraham? And when was Abraham glad to see him? I think we just read it in Genesis 14, 18. These two are one. It is this everlasting figure that watches over the saints during our time here in the earth in this fallen state. And he is here to ensure that we will be redeemed. And our focus need to be on him because he's bringing us to Abba. And unlike our Christian contemporaries, they worship Jesus. We don't worship Melchizedek. Who Carl. worshiped the priest? Carl. Who worshiped Abra I mean, uh, uh, Aaron? They worship Abba through Aaron or through his sons. They didn't worship Moses. They worship Abba through him. And so he claimed to be a priest and not Abba, Yahweh. He came to teach you about Abba, Yahweh. And so let us stand fast in understanding. Finish that. Verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? They didn't understand what he was talking about. And these are the same people, after the destruction of the temple, try to codify and bring together the understanding of Scripture. They didn't understand. And so they just did a choppy job of trying to reserve it. And so it's our job not to just acquiesce to this stoic line of, of scriptures that they put out. We got to dig into it. We have to understand prophecy and understand the will of Abba. Let's go back to Hebrews 7. Let's drop that and pick it up in the fifth verse. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take the tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, Though they come out of the loins of Abraham, verse 6, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. All right, so we have here that um, uh, verily they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. That is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. And so Paul is saying here that the ones that are the offsprings of Levi that are in charge of taking tithes from you, by DNA they paid tithes unto Melchizedek. Which one is the greater? The one you pay tithes to or the one you pay tithes to who paid tithes of the tithes? To Melchizedek, Melchizedek, Malak Zadok is the greatest. He has the everlasting, eternal priesthood. That priesthood of Aaron was there as long as Israel was righteous. The Most High put an amendment in there that if you go wrong and if you worship other gods, I will destroy you and I will end your priesthood. And did we worship these idols? Of course we did. Did the Most High destroy the temple? Of course he did. He brought an end to it. We're the only one that are disillusioned and think that there's no destruction of the temple. We still think that we got that, we could just claim to be a priest. See it all the time. Brothers be like, you from Haiti? You're a priest, brother. You Levi, brother. That's it, that's it brother. And they just run around and, and, and just do stuff. Have no inkling of what a priest do. They think that priests counsel. I've heard that. Priests do, do a lot of counseling, a lot of teaching. For real? You think Aaron was right there counseling people? Who give the most high the morning oblation? 
It was the priest. Who give the evening? Who give the Pesach? Who give the feast of weeks? Who give all the high holy days? Who give the sin offering, the trespass offering, the priest? This is the occupation and the vocation of a priest. And so the heavenly father is saying, you are incapable of doing it in that six continuous covenant. It is disannulled. Let's embrace a new one. Like Abraham embraced a new one. He left Noah's covenant and embraced his own. Isaac did the same thing, left his father Abraham's covenant and entered into his own. Jacob did the same thing. The Most High visited him and made a covenant with him. He left Isaac's covenant and embraced his own. And in that, the Most High visited Moses and saying, I'm establish this covenant with the body, the greater body of Israel. Let us not be hard-headed, stiff-necked, and be stuck in a covenant that's not applicable to us. All right, let's read on. Verse 7. Read six again. Verse six. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. All right. So people are still looking for descendants of Levi. Now that was okay in the sixth covenant, but predating Levi, Abraham. First of all, Abraham wasn't of Levi. Levi is of Abraham. And Melchizedek had nothing to do with any one of them according to bloodline. He was angelic, immortal, and divine. A heavenly priest. Let's read on. Verse 7. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may say, so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it, under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? All right. So what Paul is telling his Hebrew uh, constituents is that I just read you Jeremiah 23. I just read to you Isaiah 9 and a dozen other scriptures prophesying from David shall come this righteous king who's going to gather the tribes together. All right. With that being said, it is prophesied that another priest would come. Not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Malak Zadok. All right. Let's read on. Verse 12. For the priesthood being changed. Check that out. The priesthood being what? Changed. Changed. It's not the same. So when we adorn the title of priest, we're not saying that we have that Kohanim of Levi. We're a priest after the words of Malak Zadok that was promised in the latter day. We don't kill rams, lambs, and turtle dove. We devour that bread and that wine, that blood of grapes. And that we offer the verbal sacrifices to Abba. People cannot distinguish between the two. But you must if you will receive salvation. And those who are of Malak Zadok, that righteous king, that's going to bring not only Israel and Judah together, but the entire world, they will acquiesce to that. They're going to be saved by their works. They're going to be saved by their faith. And they're going to be saved by their belief in that seventh covenant. It shall be a time where it looked like that it's not real because all of it is happening in your chamber of imagery. But a time will come when it is reversed and you're going to see all the work that you have done and some of you are going to wish you did more. And some of you are going to be so thankful that you put in fire, you put in work, for you will inherit the kingdom to come. Let's read on. There is made of a necessity a change also of the law. Check that out. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of a necessity a change also of Torah. Torah means knowledge on how to sacrifice. It has nothing to do with wearing fringes, has nothing to do with any of the other countless hundred statutes. It is only sacrifice. But the Kazar has got you thinking that this is this is, you know, wearing fringes or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's not. Law, look it up in the Hebrew, is Torah. Not the first five books of Moses. This is an idiom that they have thrown on that word. It simply means sacrifice. 
They'll try to refute it, but it is what it is. So here he's saying if you change the priesthood, then change how you sacrifice. How was the sacrifice changed? We don't need turtle doves like Moses had, nor lambs, rams, or bullock. We're going back to Melchizedek. What did he have? Bread, and he had wine. So go back. It changed back to the original. This is the covenant that we are in now. And there are those of us who are active in it, removing trespasses, extinguishing sin, and offering to the Most High his glorious peace and thanksgiving offering in due season. Let's read on. Verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gaveth attendance at the altar. What other tribe? We just read it in Jeremiah 23. We just read it in Isaiah 9 and a dozen other scriptures. It appertains to David out of Judah, which no scriptures state that Judah shall be the Levitical priest. But out of Judah shall be the priest after the order of Malak Zadok. And so David is the spearhead. Judah is the spearhead. But he's not the only priest. There shall come 12,000 priests out of every tribe, making 144,000 priests. Countless numbers of porters and countless numbers of holy singers and an innumerable multitude of congregants that are all going to acquiesce to the seventh covenant. Let's read. Verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Going back to what we just read. It is evident that the Messiah was born out of the tribe of Judah. Let's read. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So under Moses, that Mosaic order, he cannot be a priest. And so he is not a Mosaic priest. He literally trumps Moses' priesthood, a temporal priesthood. And he is of that everlasting eternal priesthood. Continue. Verse 15. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek. After the similitude of Malak Zadok, a king of righteousness. Read. There arises another priest. Another priest shall come and be deemed a king. And at his death, was he not the king of the Jews? And he was righteous by being that heathen way, personifying what Melchizedek had to come and do. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. All right, that actual crucifixion that he did. What was it? Let's read on. Verse 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment. Not made after the law of physical bread. Or not bread, but lambs, rams, turtle doves. Not made after that physical sacrifice, read. But after the power of an endless life. Talking about everlasting Abba, eternal, immortal, for he was a priest forever, immortal. After the words of Melchizedek, continue. Verse 17, for he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we see Paul is harking back to Psalms 110, verse 4. <clears throat> Where the Most High promised that that Melchizedek, Malak Zadok priesthood is going to be, or it is forever. Read on. Verse 18. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So this is why some people don't believe in Paul. They hate Paul. They say Paul was, you know, a, a degenerate. All right? He was a degenerate. They think that he's getting rid of law, statutes, and commandments. He's not doing that. He's getting rid of the six and replacing it with the law, statutes, and commandments of the seventh. All right? The statute didn't change. The commandments didn't change. It simply said the law changed. What did the law? Sacrifice. Everything else stays the same in the seventh covenant. It's just the way you perform your sacrifices. Let's read. Verse 19. For, for the law made nothing perfect. So the sixth covenant sacrifices made nothing complete. But the bringing in of a better hope did. By the which we draw nigh unto Abba Yahweh. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. Verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Most High swear and will not repent. 
Thou art a priest forever after the order of Mechizedek. By so much was Yahawashai made a surety of a better testament. And they, true, they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. All right, so he's telling you here that the Messiah came in and instilled a more, better, perfect covenant. All right, he says that the previous priest, Aaron was here, and he waxed old and he died. Ithamar Eleazar was sent there to replace, and they got old and their children replaced, and then they died. And it just goes on and on and on. He's saying here that he is immortal, angelic, divine, that oracle, Malak Zadok, never, ever ages, never get old. He is here forever, and everybody that comes in his order will never age either. He already said, if you come in this order, you will obtain everlasting life, immortality, and you will be in this covenant forever. Let's read. Verse 24, but this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that came unto Abba Yahweh by him. All right, so you see these code words being used, immortal or unchangeable priesthood. The same thing that was given to Melchizedek was given to Melchizedek in the first century who took on the name Yeshua or Romanized Jesus the Christ. This is Melchizedek. He is the one that is going to unite the northern kingdom and southern kingdom and the entire world. Read on. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That is amazing. He is ever, everlasting, immortal, and always there to make intercession on your behalf. Who was the intercessors in the times of old? Aaron, Moses, and all of the other priests that came after them. There was always an intercessor. Even to my Old Testament brothers, where is your intercessor? It was never, ever written anywhere that we came on our own and just worshipped Abba. The Most High winked at us at times when we were in captivity and allowed you to enter into the Seventh Covenant before time, but it was never ever in the Sixth Covenant, Mosaic Covenant, where you could just go grab you some bread, go grab you some wine, go up to the brazen altar with a lamb ram and start cutting it up, sprinkling it yourself. Mm -mm. That's an abomination. That's, a, that's anathema maranatha. You are cursing yourself. Lastly, the brothers who are getting rams, lambs on these so-called Passovers, Splitting it up, cutting it up, and burning them up? My mm. goodness, you're telling the Most High, I want to slap you in your face, and I crap on the grace that you gave me. I still want to do the mosaic stuff. I still want to do it. Watch me burn this lamb, and you better accept it. You're cursing yourself. The grace is here for a moment, and then in a moment it may be gone. Accept it, grab it, really exhaust it while you can. Let's read on. Verse 26, for such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. For such an high priest became us. We are now standing in the stead, as Paul said to the church of Corinth, the stead of the Messiah. We are part of his priesthood. Actually, give me that in uh, Peter's 2.5. We are part of his priesthood. Hold that Hebrews 10.18. We now have become part of that priesthood who is holy, which means kodash, set apart. We're sanctified. All right, we're harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. What's the difference between us and they who let sin reign? It's just we atone every day. That's the difference. So if you offer sin offerings, then your trespasses won't metastasize into those evil spirits of sin. Those who know, know. And then he goes on. Go ahead, read it again from the top, 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heaven. Made higher than all the Elohim, Elohim in heaven. He was there from the beginning, orchestrating, telling them to go here, go here. Why? Because Abba Yahweh said, go here and go there. He is the ultimate priest of all and by him we offer those oblations sacrificing propitiations unto the most high let's finish that verse 27 
who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people. Now pay close attention because a lot of people trip and they get caught in the snare by reading this. Oh, he needs not daily as those priests to offer up sacrifice. That lets you know we don't need sacrifices. You're completely wrong. All right, let's read with understanding. Read. For this he did once when he offered him, offered up himself. This he did one time. We don't have to do it anymore. Wrong once again. Let's pause right there. Actually, let's finish that and then we'll go to Hebrews 10, 18. Verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Ah, learn what the word consecrated means. Consecration is a sacrifice. It is the specific sacrifice that Malak Zadok performed. He was on a heave and a wave, Romanized, called a cross, sprinkling his blood to consecrate the seventh covenant. When Moses consecrated the sixth covenant, he didn't do it over and over and over again. You do it one time and one time only. When Jacob consecrated his covenant one time, the most High came to him in Bethel and he consecrated the covenant. Same with Abraham, the same with Noah on the top of the Mount Ararat. Consecrated it one time. He didn't go up the mountain again. Ah, but we made a mistake. Let's do it again. Once you do it, and the same thing with the Messiah, he is not coming back to consecrate the seventh covenant for you again. All right, he did it one time. And like all the previous covenants, every last one of them, what happened after this consecrated? You continue to offer sacrifices. You don't consecrate the Mosaic sacrifice or co a covenant and then stop giving sacrifices. That would be evil. That would be taking the name of the Most High in vain. He placed his name upon you and said, give me my morning, evening, daily, weekly, monthly, new, mo new month, uh, Shabbat. Usually, uh, they all done away with. You said we do it once. You will quickly find yourself out of every covenant. All right, let's get it real quick in Hebrews 10, 18. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So, where remission of these, what? The trespasses, there's no more offering for sin. Where? In the sixth covenant. All right, the sixth covenant remission is disannulled. And so, you do not offer sixth covenant oblations anymore is what the author is saying to the Hebrews. Read. Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Yahweh. So obviously he's not knocking sacrifices because when you go into the holy of holies, you give the ultimate sacrifice, a propitiation of incense. Why would he be knocking the covenant, still talking about going into the true temple pitched by the Most High and not by man? You are the temple of the Most High. He's telling you to go into meditation, go into your chamber of imagery, envision that temple and go and visualize vividly that temple and you offering those sacrifices at the behest of the priests. All right, let's read on. Verse 20, by new and living way. Not the old and dead way, which was the Mosaic, which was Jacob, which was Isaac, which was Abraham, which was Noah, which was Adam's way. That's why he had to get a new one every time because men wax worse and worse, even in those covenants. So the Most High gave them a new covenant and a living everlasting covenant, which is the seventh covenant prophesied that will come by the hands of Malak Zadok, Romanized Melchizedek. Read on. Which he had consecrated for us. Which he did what? Consecrated, consecrated. for Consecrated. That cross that sweet Jesus was on was not so that you can make a gold trinket and wear that thing around like a good luck charm. It was simply a consecration. And when you come into the seventh covenant, again, the priest of Malak Zadok consecrates you. And you'll see us take the cup and heave it and wave it as mentioned by Masha, Moses. And then we take the wine, heave it and wave it like Melchizedek, Malak Zadok did and consume it. And so through his consecration, we are afforded the opportunity to consecrate you into the seventh and final covenant. Let's read. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now we got the veil. And the veil is not curtains that were set up in the Mosaic temple. He said the veil is your flesh. 
What does that mean? That's enigmatic and mysterious. And so your flesh is covering up the holy of holy. Meaning you got to go inside this body. You got to go into your chamber of imagery. You got to pierce the veil. Don't think outside. Think internally in your chamber and you can find yourself in the holy of all things holies. All right, let's read on. Verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of Abba, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. There now, it is. That's that temple. That's where the veil. The veil is your flesh, and the temple is in your mind, a.k.a. your heart. And when you enter into your heart, what do you do? You got the Peter? I got it. Oh, you got it? Okay. Go ahead. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. We got a spiritual house now in our chamber of imagery. Your body is the temple. Read. And holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Ah, Mel. Chesedek, Malak Zadok gave us the power to offer up what? Spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual, not carnal. Spiritual sacrifices. Take the bread, take the wine, and speak the sacrifices and envision them in your chamber of imagery. By the hand, the mouth of the priest of Malak Zadok who he has trained by way of the spirit to offer those oblations. I know that there are new people that already got some wonder bread and when he got some cheap wine from the gas station, and they like, oh, what do you do? You, you weigh that and you drink it? and yeah. That's not how you do it, brother. That's not how you do it. Come and get consecrated, meaning you belong to Abba now. And the priest will show you. And if you want to give them, join the priest class. Get educated on it. All right? It's written in Scripture that, the, uh, that there are seven sons of Sceva saw Paul giving up those holy oblations. They was like, we can do that too. And they just went and started throwing up some bread and cakes. The spirit came out and said, Paul, I know. The Messiah, I know. But who are you? And they beat them mercilessly. They went out butt naked and wounded, running down the street like maniacs. Don't play with it. It is a real thing. They are exercising demons. That's what a sin offering is. I know it sounds scary. Almost sounds Catholic. But it's in Scripture. They called themselves, the seven sons of Sceva, the exorcists. Copying Paul, Paul didn't call himself an exorcist. He said, we give sin offering. But the reprobate and the copycat said, we're going to call ourselves exorcists because we get rid of sin. And so we get rid of sin, but it's by the power of Malak Zadok, binding them and roasting them. And as a side note, the fire, the lake of fire that you read about in Revelation, the Catholics got it twisted. They got your mind focused on Dante's Inferno and you're going to roast in hell. All that is for those demons, all right? When the saints like Daniel was thrown in the fire, the fire was their friend. And who did they see in the midst? One like unto the Son of Man, talking with them. The fire is for those evil, nimble, pernicious, wretched, dark spirits to consume them on the enormous altar of Abba. This is how we fight our fight in the latter days. It's not by physically getting guns, weapons, or money. It is about roasting these evil spirits by the power of Malak Zadok. All right, let's read on. Read it again, priest. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, Acceptable to Abba by Yahweh Shai Christ. Uh, acceptable by Malak Zadok. This is how we offer those sacrifices. Let's go back to where you were in Hebrews 10. Let's jump down to the 29th verse before we move on. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye, shall ye be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the son of Abba, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Wow. So it is mentioned that those who despise that sixth covenant, the Mosaic covenant, died by men getting bricks and rocks and, and literally bludgeoning their head open and their brains oozed out in the street. He said, you think that's bad? How much more sore punishment going to come to those who overlooked and thought lightly of the covenant that Malak Zadok has brought forth? 
that covenant that was graciously given unto you. It shall be pain that you have never ever heard of or seen before. The most I said, oh, don't fear them that can kill the body. Kill, fear them that can kill the body and the soul. We ain't never seen our soul tormented. This is what the most I is saying. We're going to get into that, I'll be willing. So let us pay close attention to the grace that is given unto us. You still got Jubilees? We're going to slide over to the book of Jubilees 1322 real quick. And yeah, we're going to read that. Then we're going to move over to the book of Enoch for those of you taking copious notes. Jubilees 1322. And then we're going to finalize in Enoch 37. All right, let's read that in Jubilees. And in this year came Kador Laomer, king of Elam, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Selazar, and Turgal, king of nations, and slew the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Sodom, fled. And many fell through their wounds in the vale of Siddim by the salt sea. And they took captive Sodom and Adam and Zeboam. And they took captive Lot also, the son of Abram's brother, and all his possessions. And they went to Dan. And one who escaped came, told Abram that his brother's son had been taken captive and armed his household servants. For Abram, for his seed, a tenth of the first fruits of the Most High. And the Most High ordained it as an ordinance forever. All right, so now we see the Genesis 14 story being reiterated again in Jubilees that Abraham is meeting Malak Zadok and he instituted the tenth, the tithe, the heave offering to be something perpetual to the Heavenly Father. Remember what the heave offerings, the tithe are. It is you giving the victuals so that the offerings can continue forever. And we are in the winter feast of weeks where you take the winter harvest and build up the storehouse so that the priests of Malak Zadok can have the bread and wine so that the peace offerings can continue forever. Let's read. That they should give it to the priest who served before him, that they should possess it forever. This is what Malak Zadok did. He said, let me show you something, Abraham. Let me teach you about the tenth, the tithe, giving heave offerings to the Most High. This is a statute, a law actually, that's forever. Read on. Verse 26. And to this law, there is no limit of days. That's amazing. This is an everlasting priesthood and this law by giving a heave offering to Abba, a tithe, has no limit of days. It will never expire. The Most High will always require this. Now your pastor may tell you that the sacrifice is done away with. Your neighbor may tell you that. Some Israelites may tell you that. But remember, Malak Zadok said this is forever. Let's read on. For he hath ordained it for the generations forever that they should give to the Most High the tenth of everything, of the seed and of the wine and of the oil and of the cattle and of the sheep. All right, so in these dispensations of covenant, he said there's going to be different things that you're going to begin to allocate to the worship of the Most High. Acquiesce, submit yourself to the mandates of the Most High during that time. Read on. Verse 27, and he gave it unto his priests to eat and to drink with joy before him. So the Most High gave it to the priests to eat, break bread, offer peace and thanksgiving offerings with joy. Continue. Verse 28, and the king of Sodom came to him and bowed himself before him and said, Our Lord Abram, give unto us the souls which thou hast rescued, Pick it up, but let the booty of, of, of be thine. Yeah, 37 to 1. And Abram said unto him, I lift up my hands to the Most High Abba, that from a thread to a shoe latchet I shall not take aught that this thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham, I have made Abram rich, save only the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, and Ner, Eskol, and Mamre, these shall take their portion. All right, so again, I reiterate, Abraham said, you can keep all your stuff, you Sodomites. I want nothing to do with it. I have raised my hand to the Most High, and it is he that will make me rich or bless me or prosper me because I offered my tithes. And what come behind offering a heave offering, the Most High will render you a blessing. 
And as we said from the onset, we are in the Maseroth of Reuben, which is a cursed portal bringing forth a cursed wind, I should say. And in the midst of cursed winds, you need a blessing. You know, we have to be like like animals st storing up, you know, victuals for the winter. If you run out in the middle of a snowstorm, you just out. All right? That's it. And so the same thing with storing up virtue. You must have it so that you can weather these dark times and so that you can continue to pray until it pass over you. And we're just a couple of days away from entering into the blessed wind. And so it, we are anxiously anticipating it. All right, we're going to move from there. We're going to go to the book of Enoch, 37th chapter. We're going to pick it up in the first verse. The second vision which he saw, the vision of wisdom, which Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam saw. And this is the beginning of the words of wisdom, which I lifted up my voice to speak and to say to those which dwell on earth, Hear ye men of old time, and see ye that come after the words of the Holy One, which I will speak before the Lord of Spirits. It were better to declare to the men of old time, but even from those that come after will not withhold the beginning of wisdom. Till the present day such wisdom has never been given by the Most High of Spirits, as I have received according to my insight according to the good pleasure of the Most High Spirits, by whom the lot of eternal life has, be, has been given to me. Now three parables were imparted to me, and I lifted up my voice and recounted to them that dwell on the earth. Enoch is telling the saints, this is not for you who stand right before me. This is for those of a latter generation. And there will be those who can't and won't receive this, but a remnant will receive it. And I pray to the Most High that we are that remnant that will receive this deep understanding of the parables that he's putting forth. We went through everything we went through to show you that it was all prophesied to come in the latter days. Let's read. Enoch chapter 38 and verse 1. The first parable, when the congregation of the righteous shall appear, and sinners shall be judged for their sins and shall be driven from the face of the earth. And when the righteous one shall appear before the eyes of the righteous. So when we have that righteous one, which is Malak Zadok, coming before those who anxiously anticipate his coming, we will find that he is going to rid the earth of the sinners, the wicked one, the apostate generation. Continue. Whose elect works hang upon the most high of spirits. Who elect work hang on the most high power. Everything we do is for Abba Yahweh. Through Malak Zadok, Melchizedek, Romanized Jesus Christ Yeshua. Read. And light shall appear to the righteous and the elect who dwell on the earth. Where then will be the dwelling of the sinners? Now, Pay close attention. We're going to visit this again. Light shall appear to the righteous and the elect who dwell upon the earth. That is actually a thing. And we're going to talk about it in a moment. So just mark this, those who have it in your book. This is something that the Most High promised that will come upon the earth when you begin to see the return of Malak Zadok, Melchizedek. Read on. And we're the resting place of those who have denied the Most High of Spirits. It had been good for them if they had not been born. Mm. Verse 3. It was better if you were not even born because of the pain and the suffering that you were receive who reject Abba. Remember we read it in Hebrews 10? How much sore punishment going to come upon you who reject this covenant of grace? And do spite to the spirit of grace. Who hate it? Talk against it. Make up stuff. And a lot of our people are caught up in that. You tell them about the seventh covenant? Yeah, I want to hear that. You gotta keep these laws of Moses, brother. And if Moses was here, he'll hit you in the head and say, How dumb are you? Move over. The Most High is giving you a greater covenant, a better covenant, more applicable to the diaspora and the captivity that you find yourselves in. But there is a consequence for rejecting Malak Zadok. The Pharisees didn't understand when he came, nor did the Pharisees. And there was a lot more of Israel that didn't understand. 
They were stuck with their traditions and their own interpretation that they missed the return. Don't miss it this time. Let's read. Verse 3. When the secrets of the righteous shall be revealed and the sinners judged. Ah, the secrets are going to be revealed like they're being revealed right now. And those who possess sin. Who are the sinners? They are those who will not exterminate the sin that is within them. That's who the sinners are. It's not just the evil going around. It's those who will not exterminate and all these parasitical spirits that are in them. Read on. And the godless driven from the presence of the righteous and elect. Verse. So the Most High is going to drive out, not you, not me. It's not going to be our money nor our guns. Going to turn around and drive out the wicked. You will see Malak Zadok returning with incalculable multitudes of angels fighting on our behalf. Let's read. Verse 4. From that time, those that possess the earth shall no longer be powerful and exalted. Wow. Those who run around in the G20 summit, those who sit at the World Health Organization, the United Nations, and, and, and NATO, and all... They are going to have no power whatsoever. None. You cannot fight against the angels. Be patient. Wait upon the Most High. He sees everything. We must acquiesce to his will. Continue. And they shall not be able to behold the face of the holy. For the Most High of spirits has caused his light to appear on the face of the holy, righteous and elect. Verse 5. Then shall the kings and the mighty perish and be given into the hands of the righteous and holy. And thenceforward, none shall seek for themselves mercy from the most high spirits. All right. Let's go real quick, uh, Isaiah, priest Isaiah, Daniel, the eighth chapter, I believe. And let's cover that real quick. Nah, Ezekiel, my bad, eight, verse one. Let's talk about this light. We know that Isaiah prophesied about it. Jeremiah prophesied about it. The Messiah said, no man lighted the candle and put it under a, a, a table. And so you let your light shine before men. What is this light? What is this light that he's talking about? Let's get Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, start at the very first verse. This is what Malak Zadok is bringing to the saints who are in covenant and offering their oblations daily. I will tell you in advance, oblations make this light shine brighter and brighter every time you engage in it. This is why you see men of antiquity, the paintings and the renderings of them, they have this glow behind them. And once again, the Gentiles have got it and made it a halo. Solomon turned around and said, wisdom maketh the man face to shine. And we know that Moses, Masha, Moshe came down that holy mountain and his face was illuminating before all. What was this light that he had within him? Ezekiel 8 verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Most High Abba fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire, and from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. So he began to see an angel, and his angel had this luminous appearance of him. He was glowing. And each and every one of you have this luminescent spirit on you as well. You know, the Gentiles will say that it is neurons moving back and forth. It is an electrolysis, and it is electricity going through you. We often wonder and ponder, we talk amongst the priests about it as well. Where do your soul reside? And most of us will say, right here in your brain. And that would be an error. Not totally, but an error. It is the electricity going through every part of your body. From your fingertips to your toenails, to your calves, your thigh, your brain, your eyes. It is that electricity going through you. This is why when someone dies, they get that, I think it's the EKG machine, and they put that electricity back into you, get the heart started. All of that, your heart is beat, beating off electricity. It is your soul. Everything is just a machine. Your heart, your lungs, your brain is a machine, but your soul is that electricity. That's why you can have that static electricity. All right? It's matching the energy that's within you. And electricity is all in the air. 
And this is why when you leave, you can go and move amongst the electricity that's out there. But it is still tethered to this body. And so when Moses went up and ate bread with Abba in spirit, his light began to shine brighter. And when you see this angel here in Ezekiel 8 illuminating, it's because he's always at the altar of the Most High. And when you hear about Malat Zadok coming and bringing light, and the nation shall come to your light, it's because your soul has been enlarged. And it will come a time where that light is so bright that it will begin to peel out of this primal prison that it finds itself in. This will be called the resurrection of the saints. We need to do everything we can to make sure nothing dims our light. How do we get our light dimmed? Ah, we know. In wickedness, staying out of the oblations, doing all kind of crap, your light get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Prince of Darkness, absolutely. He's making sure that that light, that wick is short and that light is exterminated. And that's what he does until the light just goes out and you're back in the darkness. And so there's no chance to reignite it after that because he's put triple guards upon you now to make sure you never ignite it again. Let me not say it's not a chance. It's just harder. And so that light that he's talking about is your illuminated soul that gets brighter and brighter by righteousness and oblations acquiescing to the covenant of Abba. Melchizedek, Malak Zadok promised, I'm going to come back and illuminate your soul. And you're going to be the divine nature. You're going to be angelic. You're going to be immortal because that light is going to come out and it's going to be engulfed in a immortal body. This is what was promised to us. This is what was promised to us in the latter days. If you can go back to Enoch where you were. Actually, read that next verse in that, that Ezekiel 8. Verse 3. And he put forth a form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine, a, a lock of mine head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of Abba to Jerusalem, to the door and the inner gate that looketh toward the north. All right. So he lifted Ezekiel between heaven and earth like Noah was lifted between heaven and earth in his chamber of imagery to see the temple that is within. And he began to show him what dims a man light, the image of jealousy, having images in your chamber of imagery that is not of the heavenly father. It is not only idolatry, it's other wickedness as well. Hatred towards your brother, paganism, all of that causes that light to be dim. And so he began to show him what dims your light. Yeah, you may openly say, I don't like Christmas, but you're engaged in it. You may know and listen to Priest Rashim talking about the New Year is pagan, the Gregorian New Year, but yet you're still out there popping firecrackers and reveling with the heathens. That dims your light right there. You may say Thanksgiving is abomination, but, you know, I'm just going to go over there and eat the pecan pie. Your light just got dimmer. And so he's showing them what dims the light. And if you love the light and you want your light to shine among men, you will completely dedicate, set, a, set apart, make holy yourself to Abba. All right, let's go back to Enoch. Dive a little bit more into the prophecies of Malak Zadok, the chosen one, the anointed one, the son of the most high. Call the chapter and verse. Enoch chapter 38 and verse 6. And thenceforward, none shall seek for themselves mercy from the most high spirits. For their life is at an end. <sighs> that is so deep. A time will come where all this is over. Is what he's saying. Don't ask for no more oblation. Don't ask for no sin. Don't, don't, no more sin offerings. All right, I gave you 42 years of sin offering. You guys rejected it. And now that the end is here, you're like, oh, oh, I, I want some of that. It's, it's over. It's over. You get over there to the left. And the other ones who engage, get over here to the right. So this grace is not open-ended forever. The Most High is saying, get rid of sin, get rid of it now. Offer your trespass, sin offering, peace and thanksgiving offering before that window close. Let's read. Enoch chapter 39 and verse 1. And it shall come to pass in those day, days that the elect and the holy children will <laughs> descend from the high heaven, and their seed will become one with the children of men. And in those days, Enoch received books of zeal and wrath and books of disquiet and expulsion. The Most High is bringing together the heavenly body with these earthly souls and making them immortal. All of this, 
you will see is happening by the hand of Malak Zadok. This is how important he is. You cannot use him as some Old Testament figure that is very obscure. We know nothing about it. We just want to depend on whatever. He is at the epicenter of our worship, righteousness, change so that we can be one with Abba. Let's read. And mercy shall not be accorded to them, saith the Most High Spirits. Verse 3. And in those days, a whirlwind carried me off from the earth and set me down at the end of the heavens. And there I saw another vision, the dwelling places of the holy and the resting places of the righteous. Here my eyes saw their dwelling with his righteous angels and their resting places with the holy. And they petitioned and interceded and prayed for the children of men. And righteousness flowed before them as water. And mercy like to do upon the earth. So he's saying now I see the angelic federation in heavenly Jerusalem praying on behalf of the earthly. We know what that is. Those of us who have the calendrical study guide, we know that in the night watch, the angels are there praying for us. And we in the day watch praying for ourselves in a whole order of righteousness. It is the church working in unison. A symbiotic relationship, the church in heaven and the church in earth, the two witnesses bringing forth the everlasting prophecies and promise of Malak Zadok. Read on. Thus it is amongst them forever and ever. Verse 6. And in that place my eyes saw the elect one of righteousness and of faith. All right, we got Malak Zadok, the elect one now. And of faith. Continue. And I saw his dwelling place under the wings of the Most High. So he's not the Most High. He is a mighty chieftain of Abba, dwelling on the mercy seat of Abba, or coming before the mercy seat, I should say, because the mercy seat has the wings, but it's also the wings of Abba above the mercy seat. All right, let's read. And righteousness shall prevail in his days. Righteousness. Malak Zadat, meaning righteousness. Read. And the righteous and elect shall be without number before him forever. And those who are in his order shall be without number. Showing that he's coming with a mighty priesthood, porter, holy singers, and congregants. Continue. And all the righteous and elect before him shall be strong as fiery lights. They shall be strong as fiery lights. Their souls shall be luminescent. It shall be glaring, glowing. They shall be so bright, they shall be called the stars, as you'll see in a moment. They're going to be connected with the heavens. Let's read. And their mouth shall be full of blessing, and their lips extol the name of the Most High Spirits, and righteousness before him shall never fail, and uprightness shall never fail before him. Verse 8. There I wish to dwell, and my spirit long for that dwelling place, and there heretofore have been my portion, for so has it been established concerning me before the Lord, uh, before the Most High Spirits. Wow, that's powerful. This is like Abraham. You can get it in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. When he says that he saw the kingdom afar off and was persuaded. And so we got Enoch seeing it afar off and said, man, I want to be there. Ah, I want it above everything to be with that number. This is how great that position is. That he's now waiting to be a part of of that whole transformation that's happening within our era, within our age. Let's read. Verse 9. In those days I praised and extolled the name of the Most High Spirits with blessing and praises, because he had destined me before blessing and glory according to the good pleasure of the Most High Spirits. All right, for time's sake, we're going to jump to the 41st chapter of Enoch. Let's read. When you get it. And after that I saw all the secrets of the heavens, and how the kingdom is divided, and how the actions of men are weighed in the balance. That is amazing too. That every kingdom has its days it will reign. So I'm pretty sure in the beginning, Nimrod, Mesopotamia, uh, the Akkadians, Sumar, the Sumerians, they all thought that was going to reign forever. And the Most High brought an end to it. And out of their loins the Egyptians came. And I'm pretty sure they thought that they was going to reign forever. Mm -hmm. And then the Assyrians smashed all of them, and they knew that they was going to reign forever. And then Neo-Babylon came back up. Nebuchadnezzar thought for sure, cocky, that he would reign forever. And the Most High squashed him by the Persians. 
And they came up more cocky than he, him. And then the Greeks came in and smashed them, and then the Romans took over. Every kingdom has its time. And this is why Daniel came up unto the Babylonians and said, Many, many to cow up faucet. Which simply means times, times and a half. Your time is up. And so when this kingdom time is up, Melchizedek, Malak Zadok shall come down and bring all. I don't care how many nukes you have. I don't care how many super secret weapons, anti-matter guns you got. It's for naught. Mm -hmm. It's for nothing. Mm -hmm. They're going to crash, crumple you like an old aluminum can. You're going to be through, and he's going to bring in his saints to stand in your stead. Let's read on. Verse 2. And there I saw the mansions of the elect and the mansions of the holy. And my eyes saw, saw there all the sinners being driven from thence, which deny the most high of spirits, and being dragged off. Now you're going to see on this planet that everybody that retains sin it has nothing to do with just your, na your nationality. It has to do with who retains or remits sin. Get rid of those evil spirits. Don't become a harbinger of them. You'll begin to see them first starting in the city of Adam being moved out. It's one of those things. You ain't got to go home, but you got to get off this land. All right? You got to get up out of here. All right. Let's read on. <clears throat> and they could not abide because of the punishment which proceeds from the most high spirits. The angels were dragging them off, just catching them like wild animals and just dragging them off out of the land of the righteous. Continue. Verse 3. And there my eyes saw the secrets of the lightning and of the thunder. Ah, he saw the secrets. You could call it lightning. That's like an old antiquated, you know, think about what you would call electricity 2,000 years ago. You wouldn't call it electricity. That word wasn't made up. You would call it light or lightning. He's saying, I saw the light, the, the electrolysis that Moses had upon him shining bright within all the saints. Let's read on. And the secrets of the winds, how they are divided to blow over the earth, and the secrets of the clouds and the dew. Think about that too. Think of how a sun comes down on these electric panels and create electricity. All right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Your skin takes that light from the sun and began to use it within to light your light within you. And if you're doing the right thing at the right time in due season, your light gets stronger with every oblation. All right? So we're connected with the heavens is what he's saying. Let's read on. And there I saw from whence they proceeded in that place. That's it, right? And from whence they saturate the dusty earth. Verse 4. And where I and there I saw closed chambers of which the winds are divided. So what is he talking about? The calendrical study, guys. This is what he's saying. If you know about the four curse wind, the eight blessed wind, if you know about the zodiac, not the zodiac, but the Maseroth, which the Gentiles corrupted and called zodiacs, if you know about the months. Not the moon, but the new month and all the feasts. The feast on the winter side and summer side, you are now like part of that electrolysis. You got a generator moving now. Your soul, your spirit is getting revved up, ready to meet Malak Zadok. Let's read on. Verse 5. And I saw the chambers of the sun and moon, which they proceed, and whither they come again, and their glorious return, and how one is superior to the other in their stately orbit, orbit, and how they do not leave their orbit, and they add nothing to their orbit, and they take nothing from it, and they keep faith with each other in accordance with the oath by which they are bound together. Verse 6, and the first son goes forth and traverses his path. All right, so he's once again talking about the saints being in order Worshiping our Abba in due season. Preceding the return of Malak Zadok. This is happening right now. For time's sake, we're going to jump down to the 42nd chapter. Wisdom found no place where she might dwell. Then a dwelling place was assigned her in the heavens. Wisdom went forth to make her dwelling among the children of men. And found no dwelling place. 
So wisdom came to make her dwelling amongst the children of men in the earth and found nothing. The city of Adam was destroyed. So they established a place in heaven, a kingdom in heaven. Read on. Wisdom returned to her place and took her seat among the angels. And unrighteousness went forth from her chambers. Whom she sought not she found and dwelt with them as rain in a desert and dew on a thirsty land. All right, so she went and sought her people, but she found them not. So she was amongst the unrighteous. But that's all changing now. Talking about the heathens who began to emulate and copy the saints. Let's go over to the 43rd chapter. And I saw other lightnings and the stars of heaven. And I saw how he called them all by their names and they hearkened unto him. All right, so the heavenly father, once again, the Abba of light, Abba of power, of every spirit that was ever created, looked up to the heavens, and he began to connect his saints with it. Let's get Daniel the 12th chapter in the first verse. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. The Heavenly Father is showing that those who embrace the covenant, those who began to perform his will, offering oblations in due season, shall shine like the stars in heaven, like the lights from above, being angelic. And those who died in righteousness shall raise up, and the earth shall return them unto Abba, and they too shall shine. This is what Malak Zadok's purpose is, is to reclaim the saints and bring them back into righteousness. And it is so awful that we know very little about him. All right, and so today the name of Malak Zadok should be front and center for everybody who craves salvation and deliverance. Let's drop that. Let's go back to where you were. Actually, let's pick up uh, 44. Enoch 40. Yeah. Yeah. 44 verse 1. Enoch, <clears throat> Enoch chapter 44 and verse 1. Also another phenomenon I saw in regard to the lightnings, how some of the stars arise and become lightnings and cannot part with their new form. Look at the deep mystery that he's dropping right here. Another phenomenon. I saw the lightning. How some of the stars, which we just read in Daniel 12, arise and become lightning. Or that light, they illuminate and they will never part from that new form. They left this primal prison, this primal body that Adam was wrapped up in skins. And they began to arise from it and resurrect and become new and part from this vile, repugnant body and embrace that divine, angelic level like Adam was in the beginning. Let's move over to 44. Malak Zadok is bringing all of this to the earth by the power, the authority, and the will of Abba Yahweh. 45 verse 1. And this is the second parable concerning those who deny the name of the dwelling of the holy ones and the most high spirits. And into the heaven they shall not ascend. And on the earth they shall not come. Check that out. So as the previous ones became angelic, they should not go there. And on the earth you can't stay either. Where do you go? Where do you go? The most high said, get off my planet and get out of my heavens. Where are you going? You're going nowhere but into utter, complete darkness. These are those who reject what Malak Zadok, that the Heavenly Father entrusted all things in. If they reject it, they reject life. Let's continue. Such shall be the lot of the sinners who have denied the name of the Most High Spirits, who are thus preserved for the day of suffering and tribulation. Verse 3. On that day, mine elect, one shall sit on the throne of glory and shall try their works and their places of rest shall be innumerable and their soul shall grow strong within them when they see mine elect ones. All right, read that again. 
and their soul shall grow strong their within them. Their soul shall grow stronger and brighter by every oblation, every anointing, every baptism. They are becoming unhinged from these primal prisons that they find themselves in and becoming brighter like Moses, like the Messiah at the transfiguration, like Noah at his birth. This is who we were created to be. And let nothing cause you to dim your light. Let's continue. And those who have called upon my glorious name, verse 4, then will I cause mine elect one to dwell among them, and I will transform the heaven and make it an eternal blessing and light. And I will transform the earth and make it a blessing. And I will cause mine elect ones to dwell upon it. But the sinners and evildoers shall not set foot thereon. For I have provided and satisfied with peace my righteous ones. Amazing. So this earth that is being created, he said no evil Evil ones will set their foot upon it because Satan will be bound and all sin will be eradicated. Let's finish it up. And have caused them to dwell before me, but for the sinners there is judgment impend impending with me, so that I shall destroy them from the face of the earth. All right. For time's sake, let's jump down to 47. Let's try to quickly get through this. And in those days shall have ascended the prayer of the righteous. And the blood of the righteous from the earth before the most high spirits. In those days, the holy ones who dwell above in the heavens shall unite with one voice. All right. So we see now that those who are in earth offering their oblations are going to unite with the holy ones in the night watch. And it shall be unified oblation 24 hours. That's happening right now. Let's read on. And supplicate and pray. And we shall oblate, supplicate, supplicate and pray to Abba. Make our request known. Read. And praise and give thanks and bless the name. And give thanksgiving offerings unto Abba. And bless Abba and receive blessing for Abba. All by Malak Zadok. Melchizedek. Continue. On behalf of the blood of the righteous which have been shed. And that the prayer of the righteous may not be in vain before the Most High Spirit. All right. On behalf of the blood of the righteous king that was shed to consecrate this new covenant. And all the martyrs that died in righteousness, lifting up their names so that they are not forgotten here in the earth. Read. That the judgment may be done unto them. And that they may not have to suffer forever. Verse 3. And though in those days I saw the head of days when he seated himself among the throne of his glory. And the books of the living were open before him. All right, so we see the head of days, Abba, Abba Yahweh, and the book of life is open before him. Everyone that engaged in righteousness, their name is written therein. Continue. And all his hosts, which is in heaven above, and his counselors stood before him. Verse 4. And the hearts of the holy were filled with joy because the number of the righteous had been offered. And the prayer of the righteous had now, been heard. Now, let's pause for a second right there read that again. The Most High sat himself down and opened up the book of life because he saw something happening. And what was that? Because the number of the righteous have been offered. The number of the righteous have been consecrated. That number has been filled. As it says in Revelation 7, hold back the four winds to I have sealed my servants in their forehead. I've consecrated each and every one. You never know when that day is. It could be the day that the last saint could come in and say, I want to be consecrated. And after he's consecrated, Malak Zadok say, it is done. That number is there, Abba. You said X amount was going to get consecrated in that seventh covenant. He, she is the last one. And so anybody waiting to get consecrated is a fool's errand. Mm -hmm. Get consecrated as soon as you can. Come. By any and all means necessary, the Father is counting everyone that is consecrated, that is born again by the water of baptism, the blood of grapes, and that anointing oil that is upon them. The Father is counting everyone. Let's read. And the prayer of the righteous had been heard, and the blood of the righteous been required before the Most High of Spirits. Enoch chapter 48 and verse 1. God. And in that place I saw the fountain of righteousness, which was inexhaustible, and around it were many fountains of wisdom, and all the thirsty drank of them, and were filled with wisdom, 
and their dwellings were with the righteous and the holy and the elect. And at that hour that, that the Son of Man was named in the presence of the Most High Spirits, and in his name before the head of days, yea, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of the heaven were made, his name was named before the Most High Spirits. The Heavenly Father created all things, especially Malak Zadok in the beginning, as we broke down and translated in Rashith the first chapter that the oracle, the word was there to make sure that all things were done according to the will of Abba. And the elect was actually created in the beginning as well so that they will experience what they are experiencing in the last days. Continue. Verse 4. He shall be a staff to the righteous whereon to stay themselves and not fall. And he shall be the light of the Gentiles and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. All who dwell on earth shall fall down and worship before him and will praise and bless and celebrate the song of the Most High Spirits. All right, so we see what Malak Zadok is doing. We see who he is. We should never look down upon him. We should never overlook him. Very, very critically important to our salvation. We can scratch sweet Jesus out of your mind. We can actually even enhance Yeshua or Yahawashai now on that mighty great level. And we need to now know that the Heavenly Father has positioned one, an anointed one, a chosen one, named Malak Zadok, a righteous king, the king of the peace offerings, to be there to unify the northern kingdom, southern kingdom, and all nations with Israel to live upon this earth in power. Let's drop that. We're going to jump down to the uh, 50th chapter. First verse. And in those days, a change shall take place for the holy and elect. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for that change, that divine nature. This flesh, as we translate it in Reshith, the second chapter, first and second chapter, how that Adam, when he fell, when he broke commandments of the heavenly father and offered a foul, abominable sacrifice that was not applicable to him, the father took his angelic body and wrapped him in the primal man's body, putting flesh and bones upon him, so much so that he loathed it. He wanted to kill himself and destroy himself looking at this pathetic position that we're in. So now the Heavenly Father promised him after the 1500s of the uh, years of the curse of the ground and 5500 years of cursing, a total of 7,000 years, I will change you back into that divine nature. Here is the prophecy of it right now. And the light of days shall abide upon them. The light of days, that light of your soul. That electrolysis within growing brighter and bigger every day. He has already given it to you. The Messiah told you how to brighten your light. Ask Abba, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debt and trespasses. This is how you brighten your light daily offering those oblations so that your candlestick can shine. And when it shine, let it shine before men. For the Gentile, as mentioned in Isaiah 60, shall come to your light. They're going to see your angelic nature and be a part of it. Let's read. And glory and honor shall turn to the holy. Verse 2. On the day of affliction, on which evil shall have been treasured up against the sinners, and the righteous shall be victorious in the name of the Most High Spirits. And he will cause the others to witness this, that they may repent. So not all people are going to die that are not in covenant. There are going to be some that's going to see the Most High slaying, filleting, destroying, and burning up the kings and the armies of the world out there. And they will be afforded a form of salvation, not the same as the firstborn. The firstborn are going to be those who are going to change immortal, and they take part in the first resurrection. But there's a second resurrection that shall come at the end of the 7,000 years. So these people will go through what we're going through right now. They're going to repent. They're going to convert. They're going to change to the seventh covenant. And the world shall be changed, and they may start living longer, maybe two, three hundred years, because all the GMOs is gone. The toxicity is gone. There's all types of herbal remedies and all of that, but they will die. 
and they're waiting to rise up at the end of 7,000 years, and they will be like those saints who rose up at the end of 6,000 years. For those who have an ear to hear, hear what the scriptures are saying. Let's read. And forego the works of their hands, verse 3. They shall have no honor through the name of the Most High Spirits, yet through his name sh shall they be saved. Right. They're going to be in a dismal condition. But through the Most High and his grace that will be given to them that second time, they shall become great. And the Most High Spirits will have compassion on them, for his compassion is great. And he is righteous also in his judgment, and in the presence of his glory, unrighteousness also shall not maintain itself. At his judgment, the unrepentant shall perish before him, and from henceforth I will have no mercy on them, saith the Most High Spirit. All right, after the 7,000, he's saying, that's it, it's over, no more. Not even that secondary mercy that he's going to come with. It's going to be over. Lastly, let's get the 51st chapter. And let's read through that. And all of this is bringing together the thoughts, the understanding of who Malak Zadok Melchizedek is. He is the one that is instrumental in bringing all of this to pass. And we are those who will acquiesce to that priesthood of the seventh covenant, that word of Melchizedek, which was brought forth in Chronicles, the 24th chapter, about the order of the priesthood that the Heavenly Father established through David's covenant. Let's read. Enoch chapter 51 and verse 1. And in those days shall the earth also give back that which had been entrusted to it. As we just read in Daniel 12, those who died and buried in the earth, it says the earth is going to give them back. They're going to come out of the grave, rise up because they lived in righteousness. Continue. And Sheol also shall give back that which it had received. Sheol is the grave once again and it's also called hell. This place, the grave, and all the death that we experience is going to be reversed, and the Most High is going to call his saints out of it. Read. And hell shall give back that which it owes. For in those days the elect ones shall arise, and he shall choose the righteous and holy from among them. For the day has drawn nigh that they, that they should be saved. And the elect ones shall in those days sit on my throne, and his mouth shall pour forth all the secrets of wisdom and counsel. All right. And the elect one, which is the anointed one, which is Malak Zadok, shall sit on the throne of the Most High, ordering out wisdom. Because he is the first begotten son of Abba, the inheritor of all things of Abba, under Abba. Read. For the most high of spirits hath given them to him and hath glorified him. Verse 4. And in those days shall the mountains leap like rams, and the hills also shall skip like the lambs satisfied with milk. And the faces of all the angels in heaven shall be lighted up with joy. And the earth shall rejoice, and the righteous shall dwell upon it, and the elect shall walk thereon. The elect shall be illuminated, and they shall shine like the stars in heaven, being angelic, going to and fro, like the sons of Adam were in the beginning on top of that holy mountain, going into the spiritual realm, like Enoch, but yet still coming here on earth. Hegemonic powers over the entire creation of Abba. Everything that you see exists right now will never exist again. There will be no empires of colonization. There will be no uh, Asians uh, coming into exploiting the continent of Africa. It will be none of that. It will be the saints ruling, reigning under Malak Zadok, who the Most High set up in charge over his entire creation to make sure that all worship comes to Abba. And the scriptures tell you that Malak Zadok himself will turn around after all things is given unto him and give it back unto Abba, for he is required to do it. Brothers, sisters, we are living in the extreme last days. And since the days of the first century of the Messiah, the Prince, they have been the ending days. But the Most High told us how long this will last. It will last first for 6,000 years. And there will be a thousand year rest, making a total of 7,000 years, which is only one week to Abba, but it's 7,000 years to us. And now the Heavenly Father is preparing 
I've never seen the Heavenly Father give understanding and tell you to rest on it for 50 years. When he give that understanding, he give it to you for a reason, so you can get prepared for the return of that thing that he's talking about. And right now he's prophesying, talking about Malak Zadok, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, is receiving these peace offerings and the saints are becoming illuminated by it, preparing for the return, the exodus to the city of Adam. We're going to end the class on that and we're going to open it up for anybody that may have any questions in the congregation first and then uh, we'll check and see who we have online. And this topic of Malak Zadok, Melchizedek, is a very extensive one. We could have did probably another three, four hours on it. But we know we try to encapsulate a lot in a short period of time. And so we still encourage brothers and sisters to go and dig even more. There's other books that we could have went to to prove that he is that immortal king priest that was sent here prophetically to deliver the saints. Not just in the first century A.D., but he was prophesied to return and come and take us out of this dismal predicament that we find ourselves in by our own actions and works, being rebellious against Abba. All right, we got a question here, sis. Shalom, please. Shalom. All praises. Thank you, Abba, for this class. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you don't hear a lot of um, Old Testament, you know, brethren or whatnot to speak about, the, you know, Melchizedek, you know. Um, but you, when you made the statement about um, Yahweh Shai being the heave in the wave, um, that becomes a you know a huge argument because of what Deuteronomy 24 and 16 speaks about as far as the shedding of blood mm. for for sins. Can you kind of explain? Uh, um, let's go there real quick. That. So Deuteronomy 24 16. <clears throat> yeah, just read it. The father shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Right. All right, so this is not talking about um, the Messiah or anything of that nature. There was a curse that was put upon the father and the son to the second and third generation. And so the Most High is telling Israel that if your father is wicked and you turn righteous, he's not going to curse you for that. And so if the father is wicked are righteous and the son is wicked, he's not going to curse the father for it. Everybody's going to pay for their own. That hereditary curse is going to be thrown away or done away with. And so this is not talking about a the Messiah or anything of that nature. Isaiah prophesied clearly how Malak Zadok is going to come. He's going to be bruised for our iniquity. And our chastisement shall be upon his shoulder. We don't have to go there. The whole chapter is talking about how he and even the Old Testament brothers got to prove who is this guy that's going to suffer for someone else's iniquity. So talk about that. Let's not even say that it's Malak Zadok or Yeshua or Yahweh. Who is this anonymous person that will suffer for the sins of Israel? And so that's the point that's got to be proven. They're so antithetical to sweet Jesus or JC that they're blinded by the true Messiah that the Most High prophesied to come. That was going to stand in the stead. Now, he's not even a man in that particular sense. He's angelic. Mm -hmm. All right, and so they're looking at it like a, you know, a little bum off the street coming and dying. The most I want that's not that's not how it was. That's not how it is. So he was prophesied to come for that purpose and to do just that. So and and there's a half a dozen other scriptures that state the same thing, how this Malak Zadok had to come. And there's a reason for it too. We talk about the seven ages of creation. And we talk about how that the Heavenly Father made it all the way to the fifth age and Bohemoth and Leviathan rebelled. And they broke that order of generation. And the Most High started all over again. He started building it again. And we talk about Adam came. That was that age of righteousness. And that second millennium came Noah when the Most High began to separate the waters. This is why the flood came. And then we talk about the third generation when the flowers and, and all the vegetation came upon the earth. The Most High gave in that third millennium Moses the meat, the grain, and all of those offerings. And then we talk about the fourth. And then we move over to the fifth just to get to it. Bohemoth and Leviathan rebelled. 
the Messiah came in the fifth generation or the fifth age. He himself, Malak, Tzadok, or Zadok had to come. He had to do this himself. He was like, I'm going to ensure that nothing fails. So he came in that fifth millennium, replicate, rep, uh, replicating the fifth age, that there would be no rebellion to start this thing all over. And this is why we have Bohemoth and Leviathan, Hasatan, tempting him. Hey, you know, come join me. Get in my kingdom. We can enjoy this thing. And he stood firm, making sure that the fifth age and the regeneration would not fail. Now the fifth is gone and the sixth is here. We're in the sixth right now. And what happened in the six? Let us make man in our image. We need to now fulfill the building of Adam. And when Adam was tempted with false sacrifices, we need to reject that. Mm -hmm. And we need to stand firm to the angelic divine one. And truly, promoting of carnal and wrong sacrifices will come. They came to Adam and they will come to us. But we need to be firm in this all the days of our life. So that's, that's good. If anybody got a question on that, we can actually go to the scripture. But it's clear. Many scriptures speak about a Messiah, Messianic figure coming and sacrificing himself for the children of Israel. All right? And they speak about human sacrifices, the abomination. We talk about it all the time. That the Nazarites sacrificed themselves to Abba. Everybody that was a sacrifice had to put themselves on the altar. How? You would shave off your hair. You wouldn't grow your, I mean, you would grow your hair for whatever time you was vowing. Let's say six months or a year, whatever it was. And at the end, you would shave off your locks and put a piece of you on the fire and burn a piece of you to the Most High. So the Most High made it easy. Don't burn anything to have nerves in it. But still, yet, it is a piece of you. They say hair is living. Cut that thing off, put it on there, you're offering the Taba. And so obviously, we're not doing it in a morbid way. We're talking about eating cannibalism and none of that. We're talking about what Abba required, what the most high required of man. And so this is true. So good point, sis. Good point. A lot of times people are not going to see Malak Zadok because they're so antithetical to, antithetical to any messianic figure. When we know, and in Daniel, the ninth chapter, the most high speaks about the Messiah will be cut off. And that Messiah is talking about that everlasting priest. That's exactly what it means. That everlasting priest is going to be cut off for a moment when the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But he will return and sit in his temple. All right? So, yes, good point. There is a, uh, 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 a intermediary that always is there for the children of Israel. What we got, Ock? <clears throat> so we have a question online from a V uh, brand. She, uh, he or she says, Shalom, I just came on. Why does it seem like casting out of demons and possession talk is, in the, is a new concept in the New Testament? The Old Testament speaks of Yah being an adversary, but the New Testament is a different concept. Not sure. Wait, read that once again. Let me make sure I'm clear on that. Uh, I just came. Uh, I just came on. Why does it seem like cast, the casting out of demons um, and possession talk is a new concept in the New Testament? And it says in the Old Testament it speaks of Yah being an adversary, but the New Testament is a different concept. Yah being an adversary. I'm not sure about that. What's that? Oh, an adversary too, Hasatan. All right, uh, first let me show you that casting out demons or burning, exterminating demons have always been a part of our history from the beginning of time. I'm not sure if I understand the person clearly, but I'll try to address it as best as I understood the question. Quickly, let's go to Genesis, the fourth chapter, and let's start at the uh, very first verse. And if you'll give me Exodus 29. And, <clears throat> and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Most High. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Most High. And Abel, he also brought of, his, of the firstlings of his flock. All right, so we have Cain here not bringing the first fruit, 
like Abel brought the first of his flock. All right, and so we have Cain breaking statute, in this case, a law. The most I want the first fruit, not just the fruit. All right, now here's the consequence. This is what he conjured up by breaking law, and this is what you conjure up every time you break law, statute, or commandment. Let's jump to the seventh verse. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? So the most high is addressing Cain. If you keep law, statutes, and commandments, you think I won't accept you? Yes, I will. Read. And if thou doest not well. If you break my law, statutes, and commandment. Sin lieth at the door. Sin, the first mentioning of this spirit of sin or this thing called sin, it lieth at your door of your chamber of imagery. Read. And unto thee. And unto you shall be his desire shall sin him he desire you letting you know that sin is a spirit but the church and some hebrews tell you that it's breaking law statutes and commandments that is wrong there's a trespass and there is sin there is trespass and transgression they are synonymous sin and iniquity is synonymous two different things one come by the other if you trespass and you don't atone it turns into sin now the Most High said, if you do well, I shall accept you. If you don't do it well, sin lieth at the door of your chamber of imagery. Read. And unto thee shall be his desire. And he shall desire you. He turns around and say, I like you. I want you. And I'm going to have you. Okay. And he gets you. Read. And thou shalt rule over him. And sin, you, thou sin, shall rule over him once you enter into his chamber of imagery. And so sin entered into Cain. Now he broke law earlier. That's called a trespass. Now watch the sin come. Read. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now there go to the sin. Okay, not offering the trespass, uh, the, the peace offering, was his trespass. He didn't atone, and it turned into sin. Sin was on him, made him murder. Now, let's say that he didn't give up the offering. All right, trespass turned to sin. If he quickly would have did Leviticus 5, verse 6, we know that the book of Leviticus, Moses wasn't around at the time, but the Heavenly Father had oblations for them. All right, let's get Leviticus 5, verse 6. And he shall bring his trespass yep. offering unto the Most High for his sin, which he has sinned. So he shall bring a trespass offering for the sin that's there. All right? So make sure that the trespass don't metastasize into sin. Read. A female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. All right, so the priest is going to go ahead and make that atonement to make sure that that trespass is extinguished and sin is forgiven. Now, that's the Old Testament, that's the, which is the Sixth Testament or the Sixth Covenant. Now we move over to the New Covenant. We find that Melchizedek order transpiring. We find them still vanquishing sin. The Messiah took bread. The Messiah took wine. And he said you just came in so you didn't read or you wasn't here when we went through 1 Peter 2, 5, where it talks about spiritual sacrifices that we offer to Abba. Now let me show you in Acts 19, 14, if you will, Priest Azaria, where they were exterminating sin. They were exterminating sin in the same method but in the seventh covenant, as Moses was told to get rid of it in Leviticus, the fifth chapter, sin has never been your friend. There's always been an enemy, and the Most High gave you one way to get rid of sin. Once you understand what sin is, you understand how to get rid of it. It is a spirit. The Catholic Church and the Protestant Church got you thinking that you didn't, you worked on the Sabbath, you sinning. You smoked a cigarette, you sinning. That's wrong. <laughs> All right, these things are called trespasses, breaking law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. It is a transgression. If you don't speedily come with a trespass offering, it turns to sin. And that sin will desire you, enter into you, and rule over you, and make you murder, kill, anger, steal, whatever it is. These are those compulsions that come upon you. Let's get the uh, so-called New Testament, New Covenant way of offering these things. Acts 19 and... Um, 13. Actually, you can uh, start at 10. And this continued by the space of two years 
so that all they which dwelled in Asia heard the word of the Most High of our Lord Yahweh Shai, both Jews and Greeks. And Abba wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto his sick handkerchiefs or aprons. All right, so he, by just his handkerchief or by his apron, who wears an apron? Not, not necessarily an apron. You're right, he does have the breastplate, but it's just in the world today. Who wears an apron? Sure. Chefs, absolutely. Bakers, what are they baking up? The cakes. Them cakes, the bread. The loaves. That's what it makes sure the flour don't get all on his beautiful garment. All right, so he had on the apron and just that, just the flour of his bread offering. People were bringing the sick. The sick are demons, spirits. All right, same one that was back in the day. They could have caused you to murder somebody or he could have caused your hand to wither up. It could have caused you to just have heart issues or whatever it may be. These are spirits. All right, read on. And the diseases departed from them. So every disease came by what? Let's read. And the evil spirits. Evil spirits brought forth the disease, the pain, the anguish, and the suffering. So now we have evil spirits, a.k.a. sin, as we just read in Genesis, the fourth chapter. Let's continue. Went out of them. Verse 13. Look at that. The evil spirits went out. Why did they go out? The Messiah said when an un, when a, uh, a evil spirit leaves a man, it goes into sundry places. And if you don't furnish it with wisdom, he brings seven more back to invade you. These are all spirits. If you don't fill your chamber of imagery with wisdom, they will take you over. Call the chapter and verse. Acts verse 19 and 13. Mm -hmm. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists. Pause for a second. These reprobates sought to replicate the true oblations and propitiations of the Most High, and they deemed themselves exorcists. Like the movie, The Exorcist, what the Catholics do with their little water and all that stuff. He tried to copy. Let's not look at these reprobate vagabond Jews. Let's just look at them copying what Paul was doing in righteousness. So they took it to themselves and said, I think we can do that too. Read took upon them to call over to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Yahweh Shai saying we adjure you by Yahweh Shai whom Paul preacheth and he said the same God that Paul is proclaiming I'm proclaiming and what did he do he took that cup he was doing something okay I'm gonna do it and he took the, uh, I'm gonna do it they started copying read on verse 14 and there were seven sons of one Skeva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. So these were seven sons of a chief priest. And they thought themselves to be high and minded and close to the Most High. Continue. Verse 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Yahweh I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? They didn't have the consecration. They weren't in the seventh covenant trying to do seventh covenant things. He said, the Messiah, I know. Malak Zadok, I know. And his servant, Paul, his priest, I know. But who are you? Continue. Verse 16. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on, was leaped on them. So the spirit left off the man they was trying to heal and le leaped on them. Read. And overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. All right, they was butt naked, wounded by the evil spirit. And so what we have is a modern sin offering being given versus an ancient one in antiquity being given. All right, both of them is to rid us of these evil spirits. So let's not get all spooky and think that this is some, you know, Cleo call it, you know, the, the psychic hotline and we can get rid of your spirit. It's not what we're talking about here. This is ordained by the Most High. You are plagued with evil spirits. They are parasitical. They hurt us. They harm us. They keep us back. And they stop that light from shining that Melchizedek, Malak Zadok is bringing. And so each and every one of us needs sin offerings because we've all fall short. And we was born in iniquity, shaping in iniquity and sin. From our birth, from the moment coming out the wound, they will own us. And so it behooves each and every one of us to wash ourselves in the blood of the lamb, 
meaning the blood of grapes, and the baptism, the water, and offer those oblations to the Heavenly Father. So I'm not sure if that answers, but uh, according to what I can understand, I think that should be sufficient. We got another one? Yes, we have one from a Martin Jr. So those that got consecrated and left, does that mean that the number to fulfillment drops? He has delay, but I'm thinking he might mean daily. Uh, uh, do it delay the coming of the Messiah? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Uh, I wouldn't think so. Most I know with all things. And he accounted for those who will come in and be inactive. All right, so he accounted for it. He already knew you wasn't accounted for it in the first place. Even though you came in, we already know. You just came in because there was some good chicken in there that day. And you wanted to bite. And you had to get a consecration. He already knew it. He got a number of saints that have been preordained since the beginning of time. And so they were in souls at that point. They had not even come into the earth. He had them all lined up. And so it's not about random people coming. It is about those preordained people coming in and getting that number filled. But that's a good question, though. So hence the saying, many are called, Con. but few are chosen. Con. So we have another question from Joseph Fernandez. In Christianity, people worship Jesus, not Abba. So when we give up our oblation, is it to Jesus, a.k.a. Melchizedek, and he offers it up to Abba for us, are we giving our oblation straight to the Most High? Con. I'm glad the brother asked that question. I think you already know the answer, but, you know, there are those who may not understand. And he's absolutely right. In the Christian church, they believe in the Trinity, that God is the Holy Spirit, and he's sweet Jesus, and his hair blows in the wind. This is so evil and so wrong and is misguiding folk. Once again, you see the pictures all on the wall? Come on now, you know. I, it's hard. You know, I can say you can't teach a dog new tricks. You know, a lot of our elders, you can't change them. They got sweet Jesus on the wall, and if you touch that thing, they will lay hands on you. Mm -hmm. It is an indoctrination that is deep within our people. They think that that's God. They think that that's Abba Yahweh. When it has nothing to do with it. It is a ruse. It is a scam. It is a joke. All right. Even the Messiah. I'm seeing now on social media. Malak Zadok is being portrayed. You see a lot of dark skin woolly faces. AI kind of coming in. They moving. They all around. That's idolatry. All right. Stop it. Okay. Stop it. All right. Focus on who he is as opposed to the optics. We're talking about who he is. What his name means. I'm not going to be throwing up this dark skin, woolly hair all over the place. And you think that's going to get you? That's not how you're going to be saved. So, yes, they worship Jesus as God and the Holy Spirit. We here in the seventh covenant don't do that. That has never been part of our culture. That has never been part of our inheritance. From the beginning of time, Adam worshiped Abba through the oracle. All right, that's what the Most High gave. That's his lot. That's his position after he fell. And then came Noah doing the exact same thing. And as we said, Abraham did the exact same thing, talking to the angels, giving oblation through the midst of the angels. And then we know Isaac and Jacob did the same, and all the way down to Moses with Aaron, these, these, these middlemen, so to speak, where they would take the oblations on saints' behalf and offer them precisely to the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father wants his oblation done a specific way. If you don't know that he want two-tenth deal flour and you give him eight-tenth, it's unacceptable and you may burn at the altar. Mm -hmm. And so he had trained people to do exactly what the Father's will is. And so you may have people calling themselves doctor, you know, and they may have studied some Google surgeries and, and whatnot, but will you go and give some heart surgery to this guy? I mean, allow him to commit, you know, take out your pancreas or your liver or whatnot. That's what's going on now. You're getting these handmade doctors, then watch a couple of videos on Google about how to be a Hebrew Israelite, and they got their scalpel, and they got their stethoscope, and they read, who's next? Taking livers out. And this is more important than a medical doctor. This is a physician of your soul. And every day I turn around, I see some new guy come up a new sister come up proclaiming that they got the way, they got the truth, they got the light. 
And it's all weak, perfunctory, base level, watered down stuff. And I'd say, like I always say, become a great student so you become a great teacher. Weak students make horrible teachers. And this is exactly what we have. So again, I reiterate, we offer oblations as written in scripture. Who got that Peter 2.5? I got it. All right. <clears throat> Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to our Abba Yahweh by Yahweh Shah the Messiah. All right, so we offer spiritual sacrifices by the Messiah, the Prince. Through him, we offer these acceptable oblations, which is Malak Zadok. He take it, perfect it, even from us. There's some things that we're not doing that only he knows. And if we try to go around, we sneak around. We try to give the most high something that's insufficient. All right? It's insufficient. With all the knowledge we know, there are some spiritual things that we know nothing about. In our chamber of imagery, we're required to go into the sanctuary. And in the sanctuary, we take from the fruit of the tree of life. And the tree of life is there. Some people confuse it with the candlestick. Go check out that class, the tree of life. But the most I tell you that every branch, 12 branches, represent the 12 months, and each month the fruit beareth. All right, the leaves and the flower and all of that comes. You got to harvest it and offer it to the Heavenly Father in spiritual places. How many people are acutely aware of that? How many people just get by the side of their bed and say, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my son. Yes, that's insufficient. That's not going to get it. That's not an oblation. That's Christianity all day. So. The answer is, yes, the priesthood of Malak Zadok offer oblations for the congregation and themselves through Malak Zadok, Melchizedek, also known as Yahweh Shai Yeshua. All right? Um, yes, sir. Uh, I, I'd like to add something to that if I can. Um, Khan. Uh, Priest Rashim, can you get the Revelations to the 22nd chapter and start from 7 and end at 9? Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which shewed me these things. Come on. Then saith unto me, See thou do it not, for I am, of the, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship Abba Yahweh. See that? It's not saying worship the Messiah, the Prince, or Melchizedek. It's saying worship Abba. Khan. Khan. The angel knows what time it is. He's from that spiritual realm. He knows who his high priest is. He says nothing about worshiping uh, the Messiah. He says worship Abba. Khan. So there is a definitive answer right there on top of what chief priest already brought out. Right. And they don't understand that, once again, Hebrew phraseology. If a father sends his son, it is just as good as giving it to the father. Mm -hmm. If you sent them on an errand and said, hey, go pick up that money, God owed me the money. And the man give it to the son is just like he gave it to the father. Mm -hmm. But you don't turn around and say, the son is the father. Right. He was in a disguise. No. <laughs> Him and his father are one. It's like when a husband and wife come together. They're no more twain. They're one flesh. Do that mean that they just get in the pot and melt and then become some new blob? No, they're one mind, one accord. You talk to the husband, you're talking to the wife. You talk to the wife, you're talking to the husband. They are one. Me and my father are one. They confuse and say, oh, they, he must be God and God must be him. Right. Once again, we cannot subjugate ourselves to the falsehood of the heathens. It is time for us to return back home. Let's get real quick, Hebrews 13, 15, about how we offer these sacrifices. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to Abba continually. That is the fruit of our lips. We offer the name. fruit of our lips. All right. This is where our fruit is coming from. Speaking these oral sacrifices. Read. Verse 16. But to do good. And Read that 15 once again. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to Abba continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. We give thanksgiving offerings to his name, which is a peace in thanksgiving, orally to the Heavenly Father, speaking it with the bread and the wine. Read. Verse 16. But to do good and communicate. But to do good 
by communicating these new covenant sacrifices, what? Forget not. Don't you ever forget to do this. This is part of your daily routine. Read. For with such sacrifices. With these oral sacrifices that are part of Malak Zadok's order. Read. Abba is well pleased. The Most High is well pleased with it. So anything other than that is error. If you got a physical sacrifice, error. If you're talking about sacrifice done away with, error. If you're sons of Sceva and you want to go do your own thing, you got some bread right now that you're trying to eat, error. It's time to come together confederately to fight against them who are confederate against us. That's our problem. We too separated, too divided. Everybody want to do it themselves. And then when they unleash a lesion on you, you ask, where's the help? The help is here. Let's unite. Let's come together and offer up these oblations. So we have one last question. All right. Again, by Joseph Fernandez. Con. Is the Messiah a reincarnation of Melchizedek? Or were they separate beings with angelic nature with the same mindset being that high priest to the order in that first and seventh covenant? Okay. Uh, once again, glad the brother, brother is curious and we're here to answer those questions. Reincarnation is a Hindu principle. It's not in scripture. <coughs> Regeneration and reincarnation is two different things that sound alike. And so the first Melchizedek, he came, had no earthly father, no earthly mother, so he wasn't born. All right, He was an angel coming on the scene as we covered earlier. There was an angel that came to Gideon and he offered a sacrifice as well and Gideon ate it and he disappeared. He was gone. There was, sac there was angels that came to Abraham. There was angels that came to Jacob. They were not of this earth. They came. But now the Most High promised David though in prophecy of your lineage I'm going to send Malak Zadok. And so on this particular instance, he was going to make that angel come through the flesh so that he can partake in our cursedness. And so he promised Isaiah that that would happen. And he would be called Emmanuel, God is with us, or the Most High is with us. And he proved that you are what you were named. It's not his personal name. He made Israel one with the Heavenly Father. And he did come from the uh, generation or the genealogy of David, whether through a male or female, as for uh, the previous class that we have done. He fulfilled prophecy, not a reincarnation. That was the first and only time he came through the flesh. Other times he was always here as an angel. And when he returned, and he returned quite often, he returns angelic, not as a man. He was no reincarnation. We are not reincarnated. The angels say that when the saints died, or even when Saul passed away, I mean, uh, Samuel passed away and Saul went to the witch. Saul didn't turn back and say, I am in a new body. Why are you calling me? He said, why you wake me from my rest? Mm -hmm. I'm here waiting on the resurrection. Revelations speak about the souls of the saints that was beheaded for the testimony of the Messiah, the Prince, waiting on the resurrection of the saints. So reincarnation, once again, is this assertion imparted in our gospel that a lot of brothers teach. And we talk about that all the time. Yeah. But you know, you come from the camp I came from. And when you talk about reincarnation, it's always you were somebody super duper. You were never a homeless dude that can barely make it. You was, I was David. And I was Paul. And I was Solomon. And I was the king of Egypt. My goodness. <laughs> brothers everything but all of it is blasphemy and ridiculousness all right so yes glad the brother asked that no he was not reincarnated he came one time through the womb of a woman miriam mary and came on the scene to fulfill everything that was prophesied to come he was crucified to become a heathen way for us and at his death and resurrection he became immortal divine angelic and not reincarnated but uh resurrected all right all right, anything else? Anybody else? All right, this is the um, fifth in this series of the name of the Most High as we go through this feast of weeks on the winter side of the year. And so as I said in the beginning, treat this as the creation. All right, Cre treat this as the creation. This is the fifth day where Behemoth and Leviathan were wiling out, rebelling against the Heavenly Father. So expect that kind of environment around you. It may come through your spouse. 
It may come through a brother, a mother, a sister, a brother. You be ready, though. You don't react. You don't have that reactionary reaction to it. You be prepared for it. When they start spazzing out on you, I expected this kind of stuff. All right, so let me go baptize and anoint and let me flee this situation and go tell Abba to strengthen me. This is what we do. We are the saints and we will weather this because Malak Zadok has already locked a lot of us in our chamber of imagery. We're sealed in the feast of the Most High, waiting on the resurrection of the saints. With that, we conclude this class. We pray that the peace and thanksgiving offerings of Abba Yahweh be multiplied forever. Shalom. Shalom. to hear, listen carefully as we speak for the efforts of the priests, repairers of the breach, restorers of the paths, rebuilding the tents of David, our home is found at last at the tabernacle of congregation, where we baptize and anoint our nation, performing oblations upon the brazen altar, walking in the ways of the appointed savior with poise, escaping the noise from Satan and his poisonous nature, without fail he accuses the brethren. Using his weapons of collusion and then sin comes upon us. And we deserve it, to be honest. We were cursed because we honored and were worshiping the gods of this world and was living lawless. At first to the written law without purpose and little knowledge, serving our wicked conscience. Thus, righteous judgment was handed down from the courts of the Most High. A sobering moment, but let's be holy and pure while we endure and ensure life comes forth. Let us hold tight, secure in our roles as we strive, adorned with our robes white and clean. It might seem like the loneliest road, but we stride in hope as the Most High reveals His ideals. And so we exercise patience as well as love, dwelling safe in the Seventh Covenant, graciously sent the sustenance. Let us exemplify faith through hell and suffering, praying to quell the punishment, waiting on heaven's government to be established as it was in the Garden of Eden, when Abba had breathed life into creation and our forefather received the living word. No more are we called prisoners, we live and learn and study to be approved as the sons of Yahweh, who were lovingly given rules to better build and preserve truth. The bricks surrounding the kingdom are the seven pillars of virtue. This is a house of wisdom. Shalom.